The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special board meeting. Uh, I'd like to call the board meeting to order by beginning with roll call. Beth, if you could help us with that, please. Good evening. Becker? Here. McCoy? Here. Sitnikov? Here. Smith? Here. Vanderhoeville? Here. Warren? Here. All right, all six board members are present. Um, before we get started uh, into our discussion around uh, reconsideration of gating criteria, I just want to provide some um, some background into how uh, this meeting came to be and, and why we're meeting uh, here tonight. Um, so those of you who watched the January 11th board meeting know that we uh, had, oh, excuse me, the work session know that, oh, there was a board meeting, excuse me, um, that we had discussion around gating criteria a motion was made and ultimately tabled um, for a couple different reasons. We felt like it was important to, to have timely discussion around that topic. And so the decision was made to uh, move a special board meeting instead of hosting it on January 25th, moving it up to today, January 19th. Um, those of you who watched that meeting on the 11th know that the board um, passed a motion that directed uh, Superintendent Murley and the administration to take another look at the K-12 uh, gating criteria and specifically the model um, in which we were gonna bring those students back. Um, that was really a, a driver for a few different things um, along with current events in our community. And some of those will come out tonight around um, safe ways that we can follow uh, mitigation strategies that we uh, may have access to vaccines. Um, and, and this information uh, then led us to creating another proposal that the board will, will discuss tonight. Um, obviously we, we've gotten um, hundreds and hundreds uh, of pieces of feedback from people in the community and strong opinions on all sides of this issue. Um, and I think it's uh, our role and responsibility to, to have discussions and consider um, facts as they change. A um, Couple of things that I wanna to clarify tonight. First of all, um, it's clear now that President Shelton, uh, sorry, excuse me, Vice President Shelton has resigned her position on the board, leaving us with six members. Uh, at our meeting next week, we will discuss the replacement process. Um, but until that spot is appointed, uh, we will operate with six members. And what that means is that anytime a motion is made, it still needs four board members to support it, a majority. If a motion is made and it results in a 3-3 tie, it's essentially a failed motion. Um, so any new motions that come until we replace um, that empty seat uh, will require a four to two vote in order to pass. Um, yeah, so I think that's really all I have right now. Um, we will have discussion here tonight and... Um, Eric, can I just ask you to clarify one more thing? Yep. Um, you did mention that uh, the the motion to have the district look at another like gating criteria and, and to look further into this at our January 11th meeting led to another proposal. Can you be as clear as possible about where that proposal was created and who was involved? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I think that as a result of a few pieces of information that had changed, uh, some as a result of Monday's meeting, um, 
I had a conversation with Superintendent Murley and asked him and said, if we were to look at another proposal that didn't uh, take gating criteria into consideration, but looked something else, what would um, that look like? So I was the one um, who asked for that information and then ultimately, um, you know, put the, the motion together at, at the um, advice or under the, uh, the advisory of uh, Superintendent Murley and his team. So, um, uh, Brenda. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion if I can, Eric. Yeah, go ahead. Is, are you ready for that? Okay. Yeah, um, if we can start there. Okay. Um, I move that the Green Bay Area Public School District shall commence in-person instruction for 3K through first grade on February 15th, second through fifth grades on March 1st, and a blended instructional model with AB cohorts in grades six through 12 on March 1st. With the week of March 22nd, all students attending virtual and the same models of instruction resuming March 29th and 2021, and that the administration shall develop criteria for transition to virtual learning due to transmission of COVID within the district schools. A second. And then if I can uh, comment, Eric. Um, yeah, could, uh, could I just, I just wanna write down the bullet points of the motion you just made. So you said 3K okay. through two. 3K through one, first grade on February okay. 15th. February 15th second through fifth grades on March 1st, and then March 1st also for six through 12, but with the AB cohort model. And then the rest of the motion is pretty much the same as okay. the um, prior one. So, okay. So the, I just wanna make sure that I have this right. So 3K through one, February 15th with a blended model. So that would be, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, yeah, right, yeah. I, I just okay. said in-person instruction. Um, do you want, I can change it to blended instruction because that, that's what we're calling that four days a week model, right? So you're, you're taking out, you're intentionally not <clears throat> having the AB cohorts for your 3K1 and your 2-5 portions? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I just want, I, I'm sure everybody, as you read that, was listening to it. I know that I was. So just to clarify, 3K through 1 would start February 15th in your motion. Um, and, and in a blended model, which means Monday, Tuesday in person, Wednesday's virtual, Thursday, Friday in person. Yeah. And then 2nd through 5th grade would start March 1st in that same model. And sixth through twelfth grade would start March first, that same day, in a cohort model, a B cohort model. Yes, okay. and then they'd uh, be all virtual, like the previous motion, all virtual the week after spring break, and then resuming those same models of instruction on March 29th. And um, in the original motion, it also talked about um, administration developing criteria for right. transition to virtual. So all that stays the same. All that stays the same, right. Okay, so um, we have a motion that was made uh, and was seconded by Dawn. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions, but Brenda, I'll start with you. Any comments and, and thoughts that went into that motion? And then I'll go to Don, who seconded it. And then yes. we'll... Okay. So go ahead, um, Brenda. So the, uh, the changes I made, um, I guess I, the more I thought about it, the more concerned I was with the AB cohort model for elementary kids. Um, and I'm... I, I put this out there as a motion. Um, you know, I'm certainly willing to consider tweaking it and things like that, but that's the reason why I put um, the, I eliminated AB cohorts for the elementary schools. Um, I've, as you know, I've talked about a lot of, about our youngest kids and I don't think they spread COVID as um, like the older kids do. 
I I chose February fifteenth, um, and and because basically I chose February fifteenth because I'm hopeful that that would potentially be um, the time when our teachers would be offered the second um, vaccine, and. So if, if we talk about it and w once we have Steve talk about vaccine, if that date's going to be different, then I would recommend changing that date. Um, the reason I know people are, are uh, um, thinking there needs to be two weeks after the vaccine, um, but in looking at a study out of the UK um, where they were, they were looking at their vaccine um, proposals and looking at the data, it seems as if the after the so two weeks after your first vaccine, you actually get a very large bump in protection. So it depends on the vaccine, but anywhere from 85 to 90% um, effective after the first dose. And then your second dose gives you that extra bump into the 95%. So based on the fact that we would have teachers vaccinated one with, with pretty high levels of protection in a group that is our very low spreaders, that's why I put that data out there. Um, this, and then the March 1st date is, um, I think, based upon, again, it, it, it's based upon vaccination um, and, and whether we're able to do that. But that would be um, a couple weeks after teachers get their second dose. And so then they would have very good protection going into classrooms with kids that are a little bit older. Um, that uh, the other... Um, the other thing I'd like to, uh, well, and in the future, and, and I don't think this has to be part of the motion, which is why it's not in there. In the future, I think um, it would be nice to give consideration to, um, you know, do we need to continue the AB cohort model um, until the end of the school year, or if things are going well with, with the opening of our schools and we're not having a lot of problems um, and our teachers have been well vaccinated at, at that point. I don't know if others will have been vaccinated either, but um, I, I, I would hope that this is um, to me a starting place as opposed to something that we're putting in place um, for the rest of the school year, especially for the secondary kids. Okay. And I think that, I mean, for me, the struggle really has been balancing the the safety and and protecting our staff and our students and our families from covid which you know has been a, a virus that still we're still learning about because it hasn't been around for that long um, with my need to feeling that we we really need to get our, our kids in school i think the um the tipping point for me and i know i've, I've felt um, pretty good about our, well, I felt good about our virtual instruction um, in general. Obviously, we all would rather have our kids back in school, but I think our teachers and our staff had just have made Herculean efforts to do everything they can to provide the best virtual instruction instruction they could. I know it's not been easy, and I know they're working harder and more hours than they've ever worked before. I've um, been in many virtual classrooms and seen firsthand the good work that they're doing, the family engagement that they have, the um, projects and, and work that their students are doing. Um, and I, I just hope I, I put a wish out there for our community that we could at least acknowledge the work that our teachers and staff have done, even if you haven't agreed with our board decisions, because I think um, to me, there's no question that they've that they've risen to the occasion and they've done the very best they can. But what's been the tipping point for me and why I started to think about the gating criteria versus just figuring a way to get kids in safely is that I'm just hearing from more and more very quiet voices, people that are emailing or, or calling us and just sharing their stories of how their once engaged and enthusiastic children are, are really sinking into despair and, and um, disconnecting from their school. So, um, and I, so I just, I've always had concerns about our, about our kids um, and I've always been trying to balance that, but I feel like the, the, the tipping point has been, there's just more and more and more kids that have kind of reached the limits of, of the effort that they've put in and the effort that their families have put in to make virtual instruction work. Um, so that's why, you know, how I've come to this. I, um, 
I've always been a supporter of the science, but I feel like the science is tipping more toward um, that that it's not an a, it's not a, a an exact science in terms of what should the gating criteria be. It's more about um, about uh, uh, putting in the mitigation strategies, <clears throat> and so by um, having the the six feet the ability for six foot distancing, that was kind of that last, that last mitigation strategy that prior blended um, didn't, didn't provide. But I feel like if our elementary teachers are vaccinated and we bring our kids in, that that's, um, I feel like that that's a pretty, a pretty safe environment. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's um, uh, all I'd like to say at this point. And I'd be interested in just hearing I know there's been a lot of conversations about the vaccination schedule and the potential for that. I'd be interested in hearing about that. And maybe after that, we would look at, at tweaking some of these dates. I think what I'll do is I'll go to Dawn next. And then um, Steve, I may ask you to just speak a little bit to Brenda's question. Well, and my, my question is related to Brenda, Steve, how much confidence do you have in that February 15th date from a vaccination standpoint for our teachers? If we get, I'm just thinking if we, um, I, I like the idea of getting rid of the cohort. I haven't heard, for, for K-5, I haven't heard anything positive from anybody about the cohort. So um, I like the idea of that, but the whole point of the cohort was to limit density prior to vaccination. So I guess what I'm really interested in is your level of confidence given, um, I think vaccine distribution has been a bit of a snafu th throughout the whole country. Your confidence that we could have, um, you know, our, our K-1 teachers vaccinated by two doses by February 15th. So I'll, uh, I'll offer what I know. Kristen Johnson's with us today, and, and uh, she may have some additional information to share with us. So uh, what we've been told uh, at this point in time is that the first available date uh, for those in the 1B category is January 25th. Uh, and then the first available date for second dose uh, would be three weeks later, and that would be February 15th. So I, uh, those, uh, those dates of the 25th and the 15th are first available dates for 1B. Um, we understand that, uh, we're working very closely with Purveya right now. I, uh, and I, uh, they have a large capacity site. Uh, many of you may have seen it on the news yesterday, uh, at UWGB. Uh, obviously we're not the only, uh, uh crew that'll be in that 1B. It'll be all other educators. Uh, uh, K-12 and higher ed uh, here in Brown County. Uh, and, and so from that standpoint, uh, from a date uh, range, just anticipate those are first available dates. Uh, it's likely that we will not be able to get everybody in on the 25th. And so they'll be scattered throughout that week. So probably more appropriate to think of the weeks of February 25th and the weeks of uh, the week of February 15th for first and second doses. Uh, for our staff, of course, that is uh, done, as you mentioned, um, if everything goes according to plan. Uh, Kristen's already worked really closely uh, with uh, the Purveya team to get our 1A folks vaccinated. Kristen, I don't know if you've got uh, additional information that you could add that would help the board with this. I think the hard thing of picking January 25th is, so they've released the January 25th for 1B for the police officers and first responders, but they have not named educators yet, which is what brings me a little bit of fear for using that date. I know they're supposed to meet again later this week, but I feel like that's kind of been a common theme also. Um, the Dr. Rye did assure us that when that date is released, that on that date, we can release uh, email or notification to our staff and then they can start signing up. So it'll go quick when that date is finally chosen. Um, between last week, Friday, and then the early part of next week, we are gonna be offering about 751A staff members to be vaccinated. And we've heard that uh, many of them are signing up already, which is great news. What makes those staff, be my only oh, one A ahead, staff member? Like what? So what makes you one A? Is that the the uh, extreme medical risk? Is part of one A? Nope. It would be teachers taking care of students 
that are not going to be able to maintain that social distancing and the peers. So think about our ID kids that are back, our DHH kids, our students with ha that have autism. So the ones that are working in very close proximity with those students, trying to keep the so teachers. They have been defined into the 1A group by the state of Wisconsin. They are because they are caregivers of those students. They are acting as caregivers when those students okay on site and they're starting on site today. Okay. That's hey, Kristen, just good. for uh, the audience, can you tell them what ID and DHH mean? I apologize. So the intellectually disabled and then DHH would be our deaf and hard of hearing students. Don, did you have any? on the vaccine that we can answer for you. Sorry, Eric. No. So if we're look, we're talking the week of February 15th, you think? So the end of that week, the start of the trimester for our K-5 is March 1st, correct? Oops, sorry, I'm on mute. Yes, it is. So from a confidence standpoint in getting everybody vaccinated, if we were looking at that date of March 1st for everyone, would you be more comfortable? Would you feel well, more comfortable? That would, that, that would give us a much bigger window. Uh, I, again, I, uh, Kristen may have, have something to offer here, but I, as I shared earlier, uh, I, you know, when you think about 1B, uh, I, I know that uh, there was a big push uh, in Milwaukee uh, to add uh, employees of uh, grocery stores uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, I don't know whether or not that'll be successful. Obviously, the more people that are put into 1B, um, the longer the line grows for our staff. Uh, and so the greater the likelihood that they uh, are getting the vaccine either later in that week of the 25th um, or perhaps even into that next week. And then, then you've got to roll forward three weeks. Uh, so uh, I guess the question you asked was, do I have a higher level of confidence that we'll have a a uh, greater percentage of staff vaccinated by March 1st, I would say, yes, I've got a higher confidence level that the further we go into the process, the greater the likelihood we're going to have uh, a larger number of staff vaccinated. So if we pushed out, if we pushed out K-1 to um, March 1st, we'd be pushing them back two weeks. But Brenda's proposal also brings our high school kids back a week earlier than what their original proposal was, correct? Yeah. And, and our and our K-5 would be, we'd be eliminating the cohort. So those students would be going to school four days a week versus the in-person two days a week and then virtual. Okay, thank you. Steve, just, oh, sorry, before I go to Brenda, um, it looks like grocery store workers will not be in, phase, in 1B. So I think that's okay, just- Okay, thanks. Are there um, like, but the, the prioritization within 1B is, is awaiting a decision later this week. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So <clears throat> have you heard anything about where in 1B they would be? I mean, it sounds like some of 1B is going already, right? 1A is going already. They've talked about 1B, uh, which would be uh, protective services, which are police and fire that they would start uh, earlier in the 1B uh, group, and that would be the week of the 25th. Okay, wasn't there, wasn't there some news reporting that, I thought there was some news reporting, although I could be wrong, that there was some, uh, there was some 1B today? Uh, I'm not aware of that, Kristen. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I, at this point in time, the only ones I'm aware of are 1A. I did see this morning on the news, they had um, some of the police officers out at the new Purveya site at UWGB getting their vaccines. And I believe that started yesterday. Um, it was a, a prior film. Brenda, did you have something? Yeah, I just, um, I, get, I hate to miss a window of being able to open. Um, and so, but I understand that, I mean, right now we have no idea for sure. We can't, we can't um, count on these, Leah's, uh, the vaccination dates 
um, for sure. But uh, how, I guess, I mean, there's, to me, there's a, a question of the dates that our teachers and staff will be able to get the first vaccination. And then, then there's a, a big question about second doses. Um, there's a question about supply out there and, and things like that. I, um, I, I don't know how, how uh, will we be, how certain can we be once our teachers have had their the staff, I should say, the staff have had their first dose when they would be eligible and be able to get their second dose? I mean, is that going to also be up in the air based on supply or, or do you feel like that's those doses will be there? From what uh, and I'll let uh, Kristen jump and go ahead. Sorry about that. So from what I've understood is they are um, very confident that that second dose of vaccine will be available. So they're, at, you know, they were kind of holding things. Now they're moving things forward a little bit faster so we can get more mm -hmm. and more people in. But when I got mine, so I had mine two weeks ago, immediately they scheduled for your second one. So they're holding that vaccine then for when you need your second dose. And that's what I'm hearing from all healthcare workers also. Okay. Because I thought I and that's heard. What I heard. That's what I heard from the Purveyor leadership team too. And, and okay. I, I understand where you're coming from, Brenda, because when I, uh, when the news started carrying uh, the, the storyline that um, they were releasing what were to be held as second doses so that we could get first doses out sooner rather than later. Uh, I immediately contacted the Purveyor leadership team. And, and as Kristen said, they indicated a high level of confidence that those who are uh, vaccinated with dose one would have access to dose two. Okay. So I'm, I'm wondering um, uh, how difficult would it be for us to set a date of opening once we know when the first date is, um, is that, you know, can we, can we set the opening date more, you know, uh, more confidently um, once we have that first date known and then we'd have three weeks to prepare schools for, um, and it would just be initially, it would just be um, if we follow the dates, the date progression that I have initially would just be our youngest learners anyway. So I think we would have, uh, uh, once the uh, healthcare professionals in the state of Wisconsin have, uh, and our, our providers have given us that first date, I think we'll have a high level of confidence about uh, the completion for that second date. So, uh, you know, especially if we're looking at a, a period of like a week. So if we're thinking of the week of the 25th, if it turns out to be that week, great. If not, and it's it's uh, the week of the, the first, well then, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the first, uh, then we'll have a, a high level of confidence about when that first dose will be completed. We know when the third, second dose will start and when that, that third week ends. So uh, once once we have more information from DHS and from our providers, we'd certainly be able to give you a more accurate idea about when our, our staff would be vaccinated. Okay. And then, and then be able to potentially, um, I mean, we could, I'm thinking, uh, I made this motion so it wouldn't be so long to begin with, but I, I was thinking of, you know, st making a statement of the date being, you know, parentheses that uh, based on a vaccination date, um, based on second dose, based on, you know, all the different kinds of things. So um, that, you know, I, I'd be willing to make that um, friendly amendment if, if we, board members want to. Uh, go ahead, Rhonda. Um, thanks. So is there any possibility then if this act if this vaccination um, becomes available sooner than later, that we could actually bring our high schoolers in the week of the 25th? Is it, is it possible at all to have them come in earlier? Or is there any possibility of even the sixth, sixth and ninth graders coming in to the buildings to acclimate before other grades come in? Is it, you know, is that possible? And does that uh, hinge on different... the vaccination itself as well? Sure. So that's exactly where I was going to go. With. There's a couple of different questions there. So the first question was, can you bring the, the sixth through ninth graders in earlier? And, and as a board, you can bring anyone in anytime you want to. Uh, if you make it conditional on receiving the vaccine, it's likely based on the current timeline and what we know that uh, that week of the first 
uh, or I'm sorry, the week of the, by the end of the week of the 25th, then we would have people with their first vaccines as our, our uh, best case scenario right now. So the end of the week of the 15th would be when second dose was given. So if you wanted to make a contingent on, on second dose, then probably the earliest uh, uh, safe date uh, is, is that week afterwards. Um, which is the 22nd uh, of February. So that would be your earliest date if it was conditional on on uh, dosage uh, and, and uh, second uh, vaccine. Um, and then your other question about bringing sixth and ninth graders in earlier, we actually had a really robust conversation about that today. Um, that was obviously part of that, the first plan uh, that we brought forward where we suggested bringing them early. And I know that the building administrators at the secondary level would like to have their sixth and ninth graders in at least for uh, the type of orientation that we do normally uh, prior to school starting in August. Um, okay, thank you. Um, also a question about other school districts. Um, is anyone familiar or I'm hearing that there are other districts that are getting their vaccinations this coming week. Is that specific? staff members that may be doing that? Is there is it a health care provider, uh, I guess, issue of, of what's distributed and when? I can sure, so offer a couple couple things on that and I'll let Kristen jump in. So one is that uh, uh, other uh, 1A uh, educators in other districts are certainly getting their vaccinations just like our staff is. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing I would offer, I know there was a big news story about Janesville getting all of their um, staff members vaccinated on the 22nd, and I can share with you that uh, in a call with DPI last week, uh, apparently they uh, jumped the queue, uh, and and when that story went public, uh, DHS immediately contacted the district and, and let them know that while they certainly understood um, the good intentions behind that and, and the work that they were doing with their local health care provider, uh, even if the, the vaccines are available at the health care provider, they haven't authorized 1B to get in line yet. And so they had them stand down. Okay. And is there any reason why once staff has the availability to have both vaccinations that there, we wouldn't be back full time? And so if, the, if not, the what do you see the barriers um, for that? Like what would be the reason and, and how would we work through that? So I think the uh, uh, one of the things that, that we're working on uh, as we prepare to have students back in is our ability as a district uh, to meet those uh, uh, mitigation factors uh, and to make sure that, that we are able to uh, uh, provide with a high level of confidence uh, uh, a plan to you that allows us to meet uh, each of those five mitigation factors. So um, Eric, if it's appropriate, can I just walk through those real quickly? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I uh, remember the first one's hand hygiene. Um, we have a high level of confidence that, that uh, uh, we can get our students to the restrooms and we can also provide uh, uh, hand sanitizer stations uh, in classrooms and communal spaces so they have the opportunity to, uh, to practice good hand hygiene. Uh, facial coverings uh, is the second one. Uh, and again, this is something that will require for all staff, all students, um, we do have some exceptions for some of our special education students, uh, but again, this is something that as a district, we have significant control uh, over facial coverings. Um, the third one, and this goes right to, to your conversation, uh, uh, Rhonda, is physical distancing. Uh, and you'll recall that, that uh, one of the challenges in the first model that we discussed uh, was that if we brought everyone back, that we, we would not be able to do physical distancing. There just simply isn't enough space. Uh, and uh, certainly it's more of a challenge for us at the secondary level where children rotate um, from classroom to classroom uh, as they work through the day. So they're in the hallways and they're, they're with different students in different classrooms at different times. And so uh, the only way at the secondary level in particular uh, that we could provide that uh, assurance that we were physically distancing um, would be to use a cohort model. Uh, we've had uh, multiple conversations with both uh, districts in the area, across the state, across the country that, that uh, have used this model as a way to ensure um, a higher level of physical distancing uh, in the school. And so uh, when we look at, uh, you know, the other thing that people have talked about is potting or trying to keep your, your kids, uh, in a sense, uh, in one classroom, socially isolated and physically distanced from another classroom. 
We can do that at the elementary level more effectively. Obviously, with our uh, schedule of rotational classes, we can't do it 612. And so I, for us uh, to assure parents that we can do physical distancing, really the only way to do that uh, is cohorting. Um, building sanitation is the third one. Uh, and again, I, we had uh, originally looked at a, a scaled up process uh, with grade levels coming back on a stepped in process because that would give uh, our custodial staff uh, the opportunity to scale up and ensure that they could uh, maintain the, the sanitation and cleanliness in those schools. Um, and then the last one, and, and we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet, uh, but uh, we can certainly go into more detail with this later if you have follow-up questions, but contact tracing has always been a challenge for us. Um, we understand that the county is, is overwhelmed and they simply don't have enough staff to do this work. Uh, and so the team uh, has gotten really creative uh, and figured out a, a solution that will allow us um, through uh, uh, hiring uh, some uh, temporary part-time employees uh, to provide relief for other employees within our uh, permanent uh, year-round staff so that we can do contact tracing um, inside the district. So this is the first time that we've actually come to you and said that we think with, with some level of confidence that um, in particular using a, a cohort model uh, with our secondary students that, uh, that we can guarantee uh, uh, that with some level of confidence that we can meet those five mitigation strategies. So long answer, Rhonda, but I just wanted to touch on all five of those. Okay, and I appreciate that. Can you actually also speak to what if there aren't enough staff members? Because it sounds like we're, this is contingent on vaccinations and vaccinating staff. So what happens and do you have any sort of a, is there any plan if you don't have enough staff come forward to want to be vaccinated? Like what is, what does that look like? Can you touch on that at all? So I think there's, there's uh, a nuance in there that's important to understand, right? So when the vaccine is available, um, we will offer it to all staff. It's not mandatory. Staff do not have to choose uh, to be vaccinated. But once vaccinated, then if, if, for instance, under the motion that's on the table, uh, if we are going to return to school uh, upon the availability of vaccination um, for all of our staff, it's not that it is it's not that we're returning to class based on staff being vaccinated. It's that we're returning to school based on the vaccination being available to staff. And I think it's important to recognize that, uh, that we will have staff that will choose not to be vaccinated, um, but may wind up being on site. Um, I know from the Brown County Superintendent's meeting today, um, it sounds like so far across uh, CESA 7 in Brown County, uh, that about 75% of the staff who are offered the vaccine are taking the vaccine. Uh, so if it uh, holds true here, uh, we'll have about 75% of our eligible staff uh, will wind up being vaccinated. Okay, so just to be clear, then none of this is contingent on the amount of staff you're saying that actually become vaccinated. The fact that it's offered is that's... That's basically what you're saying. It has nothing to do with the amount of staff that are vaccinated. Correct, because we can't require that. Okay. All right. I'm being asked. I just want to make sure this was a question I had um, several, several people had asked me to reach out and ask about this in the last couple of days. So thank you. Go ahead, Brenda. Yeah, in my mind with <clears throat> the staff vaccination, it's, it's, um, mostly about protecting the staff who feel that that's going to give them that layer of, of safety that they're looking for. Um, we, we know we probably will not have students that are vaccinated. I would I guess, you know, even, even by the end of the year, I don't know when kids are going to start getting vaccinated, but, um, and so I, I would think that if we have teachers vaccinated and they're, you know, able to protect themselves, but we're still going to have to follow these mitigation strategies as much as we can um, for the safety of our students, because if they're not vaccinated, um, you know, they need <clears throat> they need to have the the mitigation strategies in in, in place to be able to um, uh, to to decrease the you know the risk of of COVID spread in our schools. But I think that it's, um, I mean, ideally you'd have 
everybody vaccinated, but I, I realize that that's not going to be the case. Um, and and at least then, because the, the spread in schools, from what I understand, is more um, more likely to happen adult to adult. And so um, we so if we have our adults vaccinated, then then um, you know we have to maybe have don't have to socially isolate them, you know, they can have meetings in person with six feet of distance instead of being on Zoom or something like that. But um, so I, I think that that just to make it clear to people, I think the mitigation strategies, uh, as many as we can do, will have to be in place. Obviously, I think social distancing, if we bring our elementary kids back, uh, we won't be able to do six feet. But um, I think with the other mitigation strategies in place, that 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 won't be as important, especially if the teacher is, has been vaccinated and then there's less risk that that teacher will um, get COVID and then we will have fewer problems with um, absence, absences with quarantining and uh, things like that during, during the year. And I'd invite uh, Kristen to, to jump in here if she's got additional follow-up information, but I know that everything we've heard from uh, DHS uh, has been uh, pretty adamant that um, regardless of where you're at in the vaccine process, um, and even after students have been vaccinated, that they are um, asking us to uh, consider uh, maintaining um, all five of the mitigation strategies. So, Kristen, I don't know if you've got additional information to add to that. Well, totally agree. So we need to maintain masking and the distancing in order to help protect because they really don't know how much protection you have of not spreading the virus, even once you get the vaccine. So the, what the vaccine is protecting you against is from illness. So then, if, sorry, can I? Yeah, you so, so then if we, if we bring our elementary kids in, the six foot distancing is not going to be possible um, in our classrooms. Is that um, allowable, Kristen, if it, based on what you just said? With DHS guidelines, it's really the six foot is more of a recommendation okay. and a guideline. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, and we do know that we're gonna have um, concerns when it comes to contact tracing in the elementary school, especially when you're looking at those real little ones because they're not gonna stay six feet away. So it, those are things that we do need to think about, but certainly it adds a layer of protection for that teacher and probably helps put their mind at ease also. Uh, Steve, uh, I'm going to ask a quick question, Don, and then I'm going to go to Laura, then I'll come back to you. Um, Steve, could you speak to two things? One, um, you know, we asked parents to declare a few weeks ago uh, based upon a different criteria. So just confirm that uh, we will allow parents to uh, redeclare if this plan were to pass. And then can you also speak to what this means if, if this uh, plan were to take place um, for students and the possibility of staying with or changing teachers midway through the year? Because I know none of the plans that we propose are, are foolproof. So I, I want to just, uh, if you could speak to what that could potentially look like at different grade levels. Sure, Josh is on with us and he may uh, have, have some information to share, but I, I can tell you that uh, I, uh, the, the, across the board, uh, through all our buildings, the administrative team and their support staff at each building have done a tremendous job. Uh, we've got uh, approximately 90%, might be a little north of that right now in terms of returns. Uh, approximately 60% of our uh, responses have said uh, they would come on site. Approximately 30% have said that they would stay virtual. 10% were still working on uh, getting feedback from. Uh, and uh, the next step in the process, uh, because of the way that Josh has set it up, uh, if parents decide, regardless of the model that the board selects, that they would prefer to go in the other direction. They've selected virtual, they'd prefer to come on site, or they've selected on site, they prefer to go to virtual. Uh, we'll manage that transition at the building level uh, and so that will afford the parents the opportunity to reach out to uh, hopefully a building staff that they've got some familiarity with and then make that uh, election change right there at the building level. Um, so, Josh, I don't know if you've got more that, uh, to add to that. I do. I, we are up to 91% response rate, which is fantastic. So we're down to just 9%, no response. Um, the current virtual district-wide is 27.6% hybrid 
63.3%. I would expect it to get to that 70, 30 split based on the rate at which um, the remainders are, are choosing virtual and probably depending on what happens here tonight. Uh, I will also say too, it's pretty well distributed among the grade levels. Um, every grade level is at 25% or greater. Um, we have one grade level that is over 35% um, electing virtual. So um, particularly at the elementary grades where our classroom sizes are, are smaller, um, I mean, the, the average class is gonna have about 25% um, of those kids staying home. Josh, is that distribution? Oh, sorry, when we look at the high schools, is that distribution pretty equal across all the high schools or do we see any fluctuation between our high schools? There's fluctuation between the high schools. Okay. And then the second half of that question that you had asked, Eric, was uh, uh, the likelihood that we can assure parents uh, that their children have the same teachers. Um, the difficulty with that is regardless of the mode that you select, um, we have teachers who have uh, approved Americans with Disability Act or Family Medical Leave Act exceptions um, that will require us to place them in an off-site virtual instructional slot, uh, depending on what they're doing right now. Um, I would presume that there's a high likelihood uh, that if you are in an off-site uh, uh, virtual instructional slot after we return on-site, um, that you will not have the same students um, that you had when you were that, that classroom teacher, because you'll likely be uh, uh, working with an aggregate number of students that may in fact come from multiple schools across the district. So then by default, if you are coming on site, uh, there will be classrooms that um, their teacher is now off site virtual. And so they will then need to uh, uh, be moved to a different teacher. So. I, I can't tell you with a high level of accuracy at this point um, who will and who won't have the same teacher that they have right now. Um, but in the, the current uh, model with the assumptions that we have, um, there will be students in both modalities that will have new instructors when the transition is made. Um, I saw Laura first and then Dawn and then Andrew. Um, I wanted to ask about um, mask wearing. Um, I know I've talked to Melissa about this, um, but I think we can anticipate that there'll be a certain, there will be some cases where people refuse to mask. Um, I would like to know what our plan is to enforce that. Cause I just, everything I've heard from our staff is that that has to be just non-negotiable the whole time that they're in school, unless they're eating. So, and, I, and it has to be consistent throughout the district in, in every single school. So everybody has to be on board and it has to be enforced evenly and consistently. Um, how do we do that? So Melissa and her team have been hard at work uh, on a policy uh, uh, process that would address that. So I, uh, in advance of our meeting next week, uh, maybe as a preview for it, Melissa, if you could bring them up to speed on the work your team's doing. All right, after we talked, I did some research and WASB has come out with a model policy for mask wearing in public schools. Um, we're working as fast as we can on um, we did receive about 13 public records requests from Friday to Sunday. So as you know, there are timelines required with those. Uh, unfortunately, those have interfered with the work that we do need to get done for kids to come back, but we're working as hard as we can on the work that we need to do so kids can get back to school. So um, as soon as we can tackle those public records requests and uh, get that those things out of the way. We will have that policy. Our goal and my team worked through the weekend um, on a number of things. So as soon as we can get that policy draft to you, our goal is to bring it on uh, next Monday. And then um, you would be able to vote on it at the February 8th meeting. So it would be in place for February 15th. We'd work with Lori's team. We've already had a number of 
pieces of communication that went out to our families regarding masks. Um, there's really, really, really good material on the website regarding masks. Um, and this policy will just be a board policy to reinforce what's already been communicated. Melissa, I'm really sorry that your, your department's been so overwhelmed with these records requests. Um, I know it's, it's been rough on you. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, Dawn and then Andrew, and then we'll go back to Rhonda. So oh, Steve, I think subs are probably going to be really important in this whole plan. Are they part of our vaccination schedule? So the, the state has been uh, very forthcoming, which has been uh, a real plus for us. And, and Kristen may have more that she wants to add here, but uh, they have offered that uh, employees of the district. Uh, and so that would be all of our regular full-time employees, also subcontractors. Uh, so of course, throughout the state, uh, our, our bus drivers are not our employees. Uh, they work for uh, lamers and first student, but there are other districts across the state that subcontract. Um, food service or custodial services or grounds or things like that. Uh, and they have indicated that anyone who is a subcontractor would be considered uh, an employee of the district for purposes of vaccination. Uh, and that would also include for us, our substitute teachers. Good. Um, the students that are sent home with COVID related symptoms, what are, do we have a policy in place or how will that be addressed when they're allowed back to be back into school. So I'm gonna ask if Kristen wants to hop back on and, and uh, talk a little bit about how we're gonna manage that. All right, yep. Um, so if they have COVID-like symptoms, which are using the same grading, gating criteria that we're using for our staff and employees when they come in, so our COVID screening questionnaire, we would send them home and they would be home until they're tested or a minimum of 10 days. We'd also send home siblings if it's a strong sense that they may have COVID. If they test positive, the person that tested positive would be home for 10 days. All siblings would be home for 14 days. Um, and if it's something else like the, to go to the doctor, we find out they have strep throat, all their siblings could come back and the child would stay home until they're feeling better. Okay. And then my, I guess my one last point I want to make about having the K-1 students come back earlier than the rest of the, um, the rest of the elementary is that is going to um, present a problem for parents who have multiple elementary students um, that will all be starting at the same time. And I say this because I have a sister who has, you know, a uh, third grader and a first grader. So she would have one starting first grade at the same time as her third grader starting virtual. So just something to think about. Um, Andrew had to step away from it. I'll go to, to Laura. Kind of in the same vein of, as my last question, um, you know, the idea of having contact, uh, contact tracers is um, I like that, but uh, same kind of thing. What happens if people don't cooperate? I mean, you can't make them give up their medical information, right? Or maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe Melissa can answer that one too, but I suspect we'll have people that will not cooperate with contract, uh, contact tracing. I'm gonna leave, lean a little bit on Kristen on this as well, because Kristen and Heidi have been doing a phenomenal job already with the contact tracing for what we have had to do with the staff and students that have been back in session. Um, we, we have a number of other sources, Laura, that we have been able to rely on with respect to contact tracing uh, when it hasn't been clear exactly what has happened. Uh, our employees though have been great partners in contact tracing and have really stepped stepped up wanting to make sure that their coworkers' health and safety is, is being protected and that everyone is, is being safe and to that vein. So we have not had an issue with that. Parents have been really good with us too, uh, coming forward with information, um, with family members being exposed and that sort of thing. Um, so thus far, we've had 
good experience. It's just tedious. It's really, really, really tedious. And I'll let Kristen talk about just give a few examples of some of the work she's already done and the weekends she spent contact tracing. And I can probably talk best to athletics because I've been doing um, the majority of contact tracing for athletics. So if we get a phone call that someone is testing, um, depending again upon which sport it is. So for instance, wrestling, we immediately quarantine the entire team and then need to wait for that student's test results to come back. So it's contacting every one of those parents um, and then giving them a guideline. And then once we know for sure that the child is positive or the student, then it's recontacting them to let them know how long the rest of the athletes will not be able to participate. So we anticipate it will be very similar going forward with um, the students. And I agree with Melissa that, you know, parents have been great about sharing information. We are able, because it's a communicable disease, to also use the health department as a source um, to find out test results as a, as a variety of other ways also. So it, it's worked well. It's just a lot of work. Chris, and I, th I think I know the answer to this, but just to make sure. So everything that we would use for contact tracing, you know, in the motion, it says, you know, it's pretty vague in terms of quarantining and stuff, but that's a pretty standardized process. This isn't Green Bay's made up uh, version. You're implementing what everybody else is. Correct. So we are having it to the highest standards that the CDC is, is recommending. So there are ways that um, you can test out of quarantine, like at a seven day test. But when you look at the literature and the studies that are out there, people are testing positive up to 14 days after an exposure. And we feel it is in the best interest of our staff and our students that we do maintain that 14 day quarantine. So we are following CDC guidelines. We're not making up our own rules. Sure. And then uh, same uh, with the rapid testing, we wouldn't rely on rapid testing. Is that correct? Correct. So if someone is symptomatic and has a rapid test done and it comes up positive, you can be pretty assured that that is positive. If they have a negative test, they really need to have that longer, that PCR test done to verify. And we're recommending to staff and students to just go ahead and have that PCR test done. And it's so easy to do now, both at Bellin and Prevea. It's, it's quick. It's easy. They don't need to counsel anything. Okay. And Eric, I just offer too that uh, we were on the, the phone today with the Brown County superintendents and all of them have adopted that same uh, quarantine isolation protocol that Christian just described. So all the districts in Brown County are using the same process. Thank you. Andrew, you're uh, back. Do you, you want me to call on you or just give um, me a minute? Yes, 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 please. Um, okay. I want to talk, I want to get to, um, I want to talk about Trying to, you know, trying to keep kids with their teachers, and it falls into, I guess, two categories. The first one being, what do we do um, when no one's quarantined? And then a separate situation is, I chose in person, <clears throat> but now I'm at home on on quarantine. So maybe that's the easier question. If I'm on, if I'm home on quarantine, and of course, some sometimes if you have COVID, you're too sick to participate, completely understandable. Many people, especially children, are fine to participate. And some people will be on, many people will go on quarantine who don't have COVID, but are quarantined because of close contact, right? So what happens to the, what do the students do if they're out for two weeks? Um, what do they do during their quarantine? Sure. So, and Vicki may want to jump in here, but I think there's actually two issues, Andrew, that we might want to address. Um, one is what happens when a staff member um, experiences that same isolation or quarantine that you talked about, and then one about a student. Um, so let me just talk real quickly about the staff member. So we have already talked about um, plans that if the staff member is, as you said, uh, testing positive uh, uh, or uh, in isolation uh, or quarantine because of a close contact, um, but still has the capacity um, to provide instruction, uh, then we would be able to have them teach remotely from home. And then we would provide additional supervision in the classroom for the kids who are present um, on site so that um, they have both adult supervision and support while they're in the classroom until that teacher returns. Uh, on the flip side, if you have a student um, who is uh, isolated or quarantined 
In particular, um, in the cohort model that we proposed, uh, essentially you would simply be uh, in the, the off-site or virtual cohort the full week instead of being on for the two days. So you'd still have that opportunity to participate in direct instruction with the teacher, um, even if you were at home while, while uh, some of your uh, fellow uh, classmates were on site. So Vicki, um, I presume you've got some uh, information to add to that. Yeah, that's, that's a good description of it, Steve. We're exploring a lot of options and trying to learn from other districts across the nation. But ultimately in that scenario, it's most likely that the student that's quarantined would be able to log on to the classroom for new instruction, just as Steve had shared. Okay, so, so yeah, right, so in the cohorts, we're, so in the cohorts, right, you've just shifted to being and joining in the virtual group. And then what about, and so 6, six 12 during, during blended is covered, but what about, um, so then what about elementary? If we are in person four days, and an elementary student is on quarantine, how does that look then? Uh, Nancy's here too. Um, so if, if she has more detail, that would be great. Um, but otherwise uh, I would provide you with the fact that we're exploring similar model at the elementary level um, where the student would be able to log in during the new instruction period of time. Nancy? Yep, I would agree, Vicki. Um, we are still exploring. Every situation's a little different. So we, we are um, exploring uh, multiple options. Um, so th their students would, what we can guarantee is students would have access to instruction. Well, I never doubted that students would, you know, have some access to instruction. I mean, I appreciate that, but I, I never, that was a question I never had to ask. So I knew we were giving them some, some access, but type of, you know, what I'm going to hear about is, and I say hear about, I'm going to be asked about rightfully tomorrow is what, what is that access going to, to look like? Uh, that kind of goes into the other, um, another area here about, um, that's related, I guess, to what extent are we, so to what extent are we looking at creative or outside the box solutions to accommodate teachers who maybe have a valid reason to be working remote, but since it's because of someone in their household, they're not getting the the exemption. Now, one way of looking at it would be to count up the number of remote teachers needed, right? And however many remote slots there are, fill them with the ADA mandated people first, and then then take your people who have other valid reasons for being virtual. And if you run out of remote spots, you're out of remote spots, and then tough choices have to be made. Um, I, that's not a model I'm advocating but what are we trying to do any better than that to reduce the number of people who might be trying to elect remote work and we don't have room such as two teachers two teachers of us two teachers in the same building uh i'm comfortable being i have no risk categories in my household. I'd like to go on site. My partner is caring for an elderly parent, wants to, in their home, wants to be remote. If those two people were allowed to discuss and, you know, buddy up and come up with an idea, that would essentially allow, that would create possibly a spot that we could use that would have come up a different way than just counting up the, the numbers. And sort of tied to that is, I guess I would like, could we be doing more to try to keep kids with their, you know, with their own, with their own teacher and our, as their, and part of doing that is being, I think, cohorted in the high school. Uh, I think the, I think in the, in the high school model, the keeping of, you know, classes together, although they might be AB, is the lesser of evils, but the, 
it, it's it's too hard and so i guess i threw a lot out there i'm just interested in in responses about what role do creative solutions play in here or are we just going to you know i'm not worried about us meeting the letter of the law for ada people we that's never been a problem here we've been strong in that area it's alternatives that i feel we've not been as strong in so I can offer, Andrew, that uh, uh, the kinds of questions that you're raising are exactly what the team's been considering. Um, and I'll just offer a, as an example for you uh, challenges that we'll have at the high school level when we look at specialized classes. There may only be one or two teachers uh, that teach that particular course. Um, if if uh, that teacher or, or one of those teachers um, has a legitimate reason that prevents them from teaching on site, uh, the team has been talking about how they could creatively create an opportunity for that teacher to continue to teach while off-site and the students are on-site. So they are looking uh, at that, and, and you're right, that does uh, work more effectively at the secondary level, and it certainly works more effectively uh, in, in the cohort model that we're talking about. Um, at the elementary level, it's a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, uh, simply because as we move to having the kids uh, um, uh, on site and, you know, hopefully before we get to the end of the school year, we've got kids uh, on site. Certainly in this model, they're in at least four days a week already. Uh, it, it's a little bit more difficult uh, for elementary teachers um, to provide that uh, uh, instruction remotely um, than it is for our secondary teachers. Not to say it can't be done, uh, but uh, um, and if the team hasn't been talking about it, but um, we just recognize that logistically, it's a little bit more of a challenge at the elementary level. And certainly as you progress down in the grade levels, I think it becomes a little bit more challenging to be off-site when your kids are on-site. Well, probably, it, right. But if, I, I think there's some, I, I think there's some potential merit to the idea of working in pairs if we have a proportion of the kids who are going to be off-site. There's times it wouldn't work if you took a, hypothetical building where no no students chose remote or five percent of students chose remote there probably aren't anything like that but if that happened it you might not be able to pull it off everywhere and i understand that but again i see i i i'm just not feeling a lot of optimism that and i just pulled one creative option out of the air of a, a buddy system between two teachers in a building who both had a fair chunk of their kids electing off site um yeah you know, i'm not i'm not okay with a system that, you know we have we've been given i've said this uh, all all along we've been given much regulatory exemption and um and so forth that we're not usually under. And I don't think we've always used that to the best of our ability. And I, I don't know how, I guess, I don't know how to put that in a motion, but I would like to see us try more unconventional things to keep kids with some access to their own teacher. And I said, some access, maybe it's not every day, but I guess that's kind of that's kind of my point there, and then I'll um, I'll come back if to I other could, points later. Yeah, Mr. Becker, we agree with you wholeheartedly, uh, which is why when a student, if they choose to move to the virtual model, would still have the circles or um, homeroom advisory, uh, they'll still meet with their original teacher during that period of time, and with their original classmates. We we wholeheartedly believe the same thing you do. And I also want to assure you and the rest of the Board of Education that we are doing our best as we model this out to have as many students as possible remain with their original teacher. Um, we don't say we can do that 100% because we don't want to give false promises, but we will do our best to make that happen. I'm, I'm glad to hear about the advisory. So then advisory whether or not it is now, obviously the time of day of advisory will have to standardize across the district for this to work, but that that's important. Um, and then, okay, so I'll, I'll hold there. I think I have other, other questions in kind of some different, different areas. Um, so thank you. Go ahead, Brenda. 
I just want to ask one quick question because it has to do with this subject. Um, at the high school level, I, um, a lot of the emails <clears throat> talked about, you know, teachers' concern about having to teach virtually and in person and things like that. But, but at the high school level, the the kids who choose all virtual will be a completely separate class from the AB cohort. Is that correct? So, uh, I, uh, yes, uh, but I'll let, uh, I know Vicki and Nancy are in here and their teams have done a, a really impressive amount of work on this. So I don't want to overstep here. Yeah. I just want to make it, I, 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 I thought that's the way it was. And I, um, I know people have expressed concern that this AB cohort model sounds like the dreaded uh, high flex that we've been trying to avoid. And I just want to make sure it's clear as to exactly, you know, what, how this is different from that high flex model. Nancy, do you want to talk about the virtual program? The, the virtual program, that I almost want to call it a, a group C. Um, so you have your AB court, um, AB, um, rotation, but then C is for your virtual program. And um, for the, as far as the high school, um, Judy is on here. So if she wants to jump in, we're looking at so many different creative ways to answer your question, Dr. Warren, I, I believe I'm hearing that teachers are concerned that they would have two preps, one to prep for a virtual and one to prep for the students in front of us. That is one thing that Mr. Murley has, has asked us to take off the table. So that, that particular option of a teacher having to prep for a virtual and for a face-to-face um, -face, um, would not, a teacher would not be expected to do that. But they would have, I mean, they technically would have kids virtual, you know, if, if cohort A is in person, they have cohort B at home. But, but the teaching of that cohort at home is going to be, the expectations for that instruction are going to be very different from the all virtual, the, the cohort C as you call them. Yeah, now, and then that right now we're looking at very strongly in the elementary. So there's gonna be a cohort C and those students um, will like uh, Vicki had mentioned, they will attend their um, community circles and with their uh, cohorts right now, and then um, keeping in mind that if a class has a certain number of students that are going to go virtual, I know that Anna and Andrea are staffing that out. So those students stay together as a, to go to their virtual teacher. So they may be in the virtual program altogether all, all along um, to make that group. Um, and that would be a group C if they choose to go full-time virtual or to virtual for the entire year. Um, yeah, that, that's, there's so many different scenarios that are, that are happening um, and going on right now that it's really hard to pin it down. Um, and it, it's just hard to pin it down. I guess I'm, I'm gonna ask my colleagues who are in that staffing role um, and really making those critical decisions and working with their leadership uh, to voice in here, please. That'd be you, Judy. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Yes, we do know that when we take a look at that cohort model at the secondary level, um, as Nancy just referenced, we're taking a look at a variety of different options. We know that we want to obviously have our students on site at least um, two days a week, um, based on what the board has been discussing. But sometimes there's just such a special piece when it comes to licensure and the high school um, and some of the courses that it may make um, maybe better for the students and the teacher to have the students stay with the um, group that they are with versus going to a separate virtual program. And then, um, so let me give you an example of what we're doing right now for um, at the GED class at East High School, where the teacher wants to remain virtual, um, but yet we need students who are going to be on site and the instruction, you know, having a para and or a monitor in the classroom while the teacher is still delivering instruction virtually 
maybe a better option than trying to take students and put them into a virtual program. That's just one small example. So again, as the board makes their decision this evening, we are prepared to um, operationalize that um, in meeting the needs of our students. And I guess just the last point, I, I would echo Andrew's um, opinion that I, I would I would support creative problem solving around this that that makes sense within you know your actual numbers in your school. Um, I'd rather see that than trying to make this universal and you know everybody has to follow the same rules because there may be some really obvious solutions in one school that can't be a solution in another school just because of the um, percentages and the who's teaching what and all those variables. We would appreciate that latitude. Thank you. But we don't do we we don't do that here much. We have we have forms. We have multiple levels of approval for things, and it it. We, things are as hard or harder to get approved now, even with some regulatory flexibility from the district and waivers of instructional minutes and things that would get in the way. So it, it, sounds, it sounds good, but chances are, um, unless someone can convince me that I'm wrong, the, uh, the hypothetical situation of two teachers who have about half and half buddying up for one to be remote and one to be on site, I think nine times out of 10, that gets blocked somewhere in the process or the approval takes too long or, or it comes around to being approved at central office, but, by the, but it's too late because we had to make staffing decisions because it's March 15th already. Is there a way that, and the answer is not always gonna be yes. There might be something that's not gonna work. I get that. But like, I don't know how a grassroots idea even has of something that might be good and something I may have never thought of, how it even has a chance to, to get there. Because we have, like I said, it took, it took board meeting action to unblock forms for lab science classes to happen. And verbally, we said weeks ago that lab science classes could start filling out the forms. So how, like... I'm probably not, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time because I'm probably not going to be convinced anyways. And I can't, I can't write it into a motion, but if I could get some assurance, I guess here on camera that grassroots ideas are welcome and all ideas will get consideration at least. Um, I guess I'd feel better about that. So I would offer that. Not, uh, and I would say, then don't say it if I mean, it's, that's not how it's going to be. Of course. So I, I would offer, and and, uh, and Vicky and Nancy and, and Judy, uh, I believe uh, Ann and Andrea are on, uh, with us too, and, and Renee, uh, it's really been, uh, at least from my experience working with them so far, it's been all hands on deck, no idea is a bad idea. I, I, in the end, it's, it's what can we do that provides the most educational integrity for our students if it's not something we've done before, uh, it's something we've entertained. Uh, you know, this idea, and I know uh, uh, this came up uh, through our secondary crew, but the idea that, uh, you know, we can find a way uh, if a teacher is, is uh, going to be uh, off-site uh, through approved processes and, and we can find a way to have them teach kids who are on-site, um, it, it's been a kind of if there's a will, there's a way type of process. So. Uh, I have not seen uh, resistance um, to creativity or an unwillingness to entertain uh, ideas that we've not explored before. So um, Vicki or Nancy or any of our exec leaders from the schools, I'd, I'd welcome you to chime in there. I would just say that I, I, I regret that you think that our administrators are blocking opportunities for doing what's in the best interest of our students, Mr. Becker. I, I don't know of any situation where uh, there's been a holdup of the face-to-face -face process um, other than the one that I had mentioned at the, the board meeting. I think there were two maybe last board meeting um, for FFA because we were waiting on the co-curriculars and offhand, I can't remember the other. Um, 
So uh, I, I'm sorry that you continue to feel that way. Um, I would just say that our administrative team and our principals have been working really, really hard to provide students with the best care that we can get to them right now, including face-to-face -face opportunities. Just to avoid a mischaracterization, I think I'm talking more about, although I do think there were cases that that some somewhere lower in the shuffle, some of these lab science requests didn't happen as fast as they could have. I know, and I was happy to hear that by as the ball got rolling, 70 as of last week did did go through. Okay, I'm talking more. I guess I'm talking more about systems. If I'm a, if I'm a young if I'm a new new to the district teacher and the other person who has half of their kids off, half of their third graders off site is a new to the district teacher. Do I even know, do I even know that it's okay to bring my idea up? I think we, we probably would have to be actively, actively encouraging and pushing down from the top that, um, ideas from all levels are are good and we're interested in hearing them the the best idea for how to there might be an idea i mean there's not one best model but the it could be there's an idea that is just the light bulb idea for hundreds of k2 kids that hasn't come up in a meeting yet that one of our uh, one of our new to the district teachers might have maybe I just don't know how it even, I, I think there needs to be encouragement to submit all ideas and encouragement from, you know, to principals that we want to hear the ideas from, you know, you and your staff and it, the answer might not be yes, but we want to hear it because sometimes even if it's not, this isn't going to work, it might bring us to something else that's going to work. And, you know, we have, a, um, there's just a lot of, um, I think historical and cultural factors largely about people who aren't in the district today. And I just want to make sure that we're encouraging that flow of ideas at all levels, not just those who are more senior and are in work groups and so forth. All right, I'm gonna to go to Rhonda and then to Laura. Um, okay, so I have a couple questions. First, my, my first question is, are reading interventionists going to be allowed to teach face-to-face? -face? Sorry, I'm on mute there. I'm gonna ask uh, Nancy to chime in because I know they've been working really hard on how to uh, both uh, provide interventionist service, um, but then also try to adhere to the mitigation strategies. Uh, th thank you. Um, again, there's gonna be, it's going to be based on the students' needs. Currently, all of our interventions are virtual interventions, and the student group is made up of multiple students from different classrooms. When we know when we go back face-to-face, -face, we can't provide that from multiple classrooms with one teacher. The other piece would be that, there, that students are in an intervention for a set period of time, anywhere from eight to 12 weeks, so if the, the intervention group is together and the teachers work in the intervention and the, the uh, cycle for the intervention is not completed, they would stay intact until the end of that intervention. I'll give you a perfect example. One of the building principals in the meeting asked, I have you know, five first graders, the interventionists, all, five first graders all from the same group. Is there any objection to uh, meeting face-to-face -face or having intervention face-to-face -face with those first graders? Absolutely not. And so you really have to look at absolutely every single one of the scenarios that you're in, knowing that number one, our students need to be safe. Number two, those are fragile, our students in intervention are uh, fragile learners at the time. They're uh, in a sink of learning. They're in a cycle of learning. And the teacher is progress monitoring and monitoring their progress um, for uh, future interventions or to exit the intervention. And so keeping all of those can all into in consideration and we have a plethora of interventions and so we can't just mix and choose there there's a system to this mlss piece but i can guarantee you that if if all the conditions are met 
It can safely be done. Absolutely, an interventionist can provide face-to-face -face intervention. Okay, when you say conditions are met, can you, like what are specifics? Well, they, we would not be able to have, depend, again, it depends on where we're at with CDC, how, how far we are with the pandemic and the measures. We'd have to follow those very closely. So conditions to be met, if they were going back today, they would be remaining in their virtual um, intervention groups. Um, they're in the middle of an intervention cycle right now. And so they would remain, and they're cross, um, they have cross representation from multiple students from multiple rooms across the school. Um, so th for the conditions to be met, there would have to be a place in the school where there could be the social distancing from the teacher and uh, either plexiglass or the, the proper protection. And then um, the student population in that. So if it was an intervention with three students, they'd all have to come from the same classroom. So those are the conditions that I'm speaking of. Like we can't put them in a small group and bring individual kids from different classrooms into a small area to work with one teacher. Even if and they could social distance, even if they could be six feet apart, let's say you had three students and you could space them six feet apart. And that, that, that wouldn't be possible. If they're in the same intervention and they meet the conditions that it really comes down yeah to the conditions in the building, do you have a room that's large enough for that intervention to happen? Typically, then I'm not gonna speculate because all the rooms are all different uh, across the district. So once we, they're, they're completed their intervention cycle and the students, we first would like them to have to, the students come from the same classroom. If that's not doable and they do, I mean, I'm not gonna rule out that if they're six feet apart, they can't meet with the same teacher. Mm -hmm. There may be a time that they can do that, but I'm also not going to go on record and say, absolutely, they can meet with the same teacher from multiple classrooms because I, I can't guarantee the conditions, the physical environment would be acceptable to having that happen in a safe, in a safe way. But can you, can you go on record um, answering that if the room is big enough to space six feet apart with three students, even if they're not from the same classroom, is, is the physical space, is the criteria that they can be six feet apart or what is the, I know you've mentioned it a couple of times, like what is this physical space that's contingent or is necessary to have that, I guess, be a possibility where you could have three students? And maybe Kristen might uh, be able to offer some, some input on this because I, I think one of the challenges obviously is we're trying to minimize the number of vectors out there. And so when you start bringing students in from different classrooms, they now become vectors back to their original classroom. But um, Kristen, you may be able to offer some, some additional insight into that. Yep, you're exactly right in how you just worded that. So we wanna to try to keep the same group of kids together. So if you picture you've got your 3K group, we don't wanna be mixing them with other 3K groups or getting in with kids of first grade. So if we isolate or need to quarantine, excuse me, a group of students, we want it to just affect that small group. Can you say, or can we say, if we had children, let's say there's four second grade classrooms, you bring them all into a room, they're separated by six feet. But can we say with 100% certainty that those kids did not spend 15 minutes within six feet as they're walking down the hall and things like that? So that's what we're looking at is trying to keep the same groups of kids together. So not, we don't wipe out large portions of the school. It's small little groups. Okay, Eric, and then I have, go ahead. And then I have um, a couple more questions. Thank you, I appreciate that, Rhonda. Um, Nancy, if this isn't the best for you, you can hand it to somebody else, but what about um, our school staff that travel around the building or see multiple groups? So I, I think about, uh, you know, physical education, music, um, art, and then even our paraprofessionals or special ed monitors, ESL, th those positions who are in multiple spots, what, uh, how do their jobs change? Because the direct um, decision makers are my colleagues in this group, I'm gonna ask Ann, Andrea, and Judy, uh, mostly Ann and Andrea, who have worked um, closely with the staff in developing those physical education, art, music, 
um, playground schedules. So if I could have Ann and Andrea answer that question, I think you would be the most informed. Are they, are they on? There's Ann. There she is. Oh, now she's off. There's Andrea. Andrea's on. There they are. Thanks, guys. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to uh, bring you in unsolicited like that, but uh, just curious if you can speak a little bit to, um, you know, the, the teachers in our building or the staff in our building who traditionally are in multiple classrooms, uh, whether that's uh, special ed paras, instructors, ESL, and then um, gym music, FIED, some of those positions. How does that look differently um, in, in this model? I will start with this and then I'll let um, Andrea, my partner, um, chime in on it. But we have, we have worked to be sure that our, um, our specialists do not have to travel to more than um, two buildings. And they used to travel, you know, we could have more travels than that. And our goal is to really have them only be in one building a day. And if they have to be in a different building, only one additional. And, and that's just part of getting our scheduling done. We're looking at having, um, depending on, on what, our, what the decision is, we're looking at possibly having a longer class period so that the teachers don't have to be in and out of classrooms as much. But we're looking at them having the students travel to them with all the mitigation factors with passing in the hallways, everything set up that way with making sure that students mask. And um, we're looking at different locations, for instance, for um, music so that, because our music rooms aren't always really large, but we, we have access to bigger spaces. Some buildings have commons. We have our library media center that we can put have kids in. So they would, be, they would be distant six feet for music and they would be masked. And we're looking at the same thing for art is to be sure that we can distance students and the same with FIAD. So, you know, it'd be nice if this was a time of year we could have our kids outside for FIAD. It's not looking really good right now. Um, but as soon as they can go outside, they would still be outside either in the building or outside, but they will mask for their, their programs. Andrea, anything I missed? Partner. You have not, you comprehensively covered it. Thank you. I really have nothing else to add. Um, Rhonda had so let me jump in. So I'm gonna go back to Rhonda and then I'll go to Laura. Okay. Um, so I just wanna make sure to mention, when I look at the timeline and the motion that Brenda put forward, it puts our I would argue some of our most vulnerable students academically and personally um, still another five weeks out before they're in school. Um, I'd like to know, I mean, and, and, and I have concerns about that for obvious reasons, um, the entire reason why we're even contemplating this, but what, what are the barriers to bringing them back within those five weeks. It's another five weeks yet. So what would we need to, what would need to happen to have them come in earlier? Brent, I guess I'll ask Brenda. Brenda, what do you, like, I know you put that motion together and, and you have that timeline, but knowing the struggles, knowing the personal struggles, right? We've heard from these students, we've heard from their families. Um, we've seen the data on the, on the academics, um, what would it take to bring them back earlier? Or what do you feel it would take? Um, I, I mean, I put those, my concern is that, and why I put those dates out there is based upon, because we know the biggest challenge, I mean, our, our burden, our case burden rate is fairly high right now. Um, I don't know what direction it will go. There's a new strain coming. I don't know if that'll um, change anything. But but um, the biggest challenge for school districts that have been open is 
having enough staff to be in to staff their classrooms. And I just feel, I mean, I, I feel like the one thing virtual instruction has provided us is consistency. I mean, students know every day what's, what's going to happen. I'm concerned that if we open before we have our staff um, vaccinated, that we will have problems with staffing and we'll have this system that, that, you know, where we have what other school districts have, where you've got, you know, classrooms or entire schools going into quarantine, um, kids that are quarantining themselves um, for, for different reasons. I just feel like that vaccination thing is something that that's, gives us a layer of protection that makes it much more likely that once we do open and bring kids back, we'll be able to maintain that. We won't have this back and forth. Um, so that's why I chose the dates. Um, I, uh, anyway, that's. Okay, so, and so I hear that you're concerned and obviously the vaccinations seem to be kind of the, you know, it's contingent on that. Are we as concerned about what's actually, I know we're concerned about what might happen. Are we as concerned about what is happening right now? And are we as concerned about the fact that again, those students would have to wait five more weeks? Um, what do we feel are the liabilities for that, for waiting five more weeks as far as how, how it's going for them, for the students? I'm very concerned about that. And if, the votes are not here to bring them back earlier. What are we planning to do for another five weeks? We will potentially lose more students. We will probably lose more families. So I just wanna know if, if there's any appetite at all for even coming back another week, like even one more week. And, and if not, um, I just, I just want to know if, if maybe I'm the only person having these concerns about those students. Um, but what can be done? Is there anything we can do to offer these the students and their families some relief? What's five weeks out? What's another month in the winter? Ron, I mean, I, I can. Uh answer your question, you're just kind of throwing it out there. So, I mean, I think, uh, one, I, I think it's uh, a mischaracterization to say that you're the only one who cares about the families that are struggling. That's, it, to be honest, that, that hurts a little bit. I think that's- No, 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 no. I didn't say that. Maybe <laughs> I am. I'd like to hear that you are, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I, I well, don't well, want to assume that anyone yeah. is. Right. I didn't so, say so that anybody that, was. Well, you, you implied that you were the only one that no, maybe cared. I didn't. I those okay. words would well, never I, come well, out of my I, mouth. I'm bringing it up. I'm the only one bringing it up. That's a fact. So no, I would I, never I think, say I think that. You're, I, no, 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 no. That's actually not okay, and that's not fair. I would never say that, but it is a fact, okay. and I'm the only one okay. bringing it up. So I'd well, like to know how you feel. Very good. I will answer Great. that question and I'll let everybody else respond to see if they implied if they felt that way. So they can answer that for themselves. I would say that we're balancing science with a pragmatic need to bring our kids back as soon as possible. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of being responsible and responsive. And it's, it's been a tremendous challenge to understand that kids are struggling and we're in a global pandemic and to try to find that balance. And I've talked about it a long time that there's this spectrum of what safety means and what is the most important to you and how you find that, that happy medium. And um, from a lot of the families that I've talked to and the people, the, the, the conversations that I've had is, yes, they want to come back. Um, and, and some are want to do it yesterday and others, you know, want to find a, a responsible time to do that. So, um, it's my hope that we can pass a motion today with a date. And again, for some people, it's not going to be fast enough. And for other people, it's going to be too fast. And they, they wish that we, you know, would wait longer. So it's about finding that compromise. And I think that um, it, it's a responsible way. We've talked about following the science, knowing that the staff in our district that want a vaccine will be able to have one if we come back on this date. I feel like is a compromise for me personally, where I stand in, in the term of safety, because everybody has a different interpretation of that rule. That's why I'm supportive of this. 
And I would hope that a family would say, okay, well, this isn't as fast as I wanted it, but the, and maybe it's not as many days as I want, but at least we have a date. We know what we can plan on and we can, can go forward with that. So that's where I stand on this. And I appreciate that. And I can agree with you on all of that. But I guess what I'm wondering about is, okay, we, we speak a lot about the families, the parents, but when it comes to the students, to the kids that we're talking about, I just want to share that I am very concerned about five more weeks of them being out of school. And there are other districts who have obviously had that concern as well, which is why they're bringing them back earlier. So I'd like to know what are we doing? Are, why are we willing, I guess, I know it's, you're saying it's vaccinations, but what is the plan for these students for five more weeks? because I'm just really concerned about them. Yeah. And, so and, and I'm not, and I'm not in a million years would I sit here and, and tell people that they're not concerned, but I am bringing it up because it's, that's, that is what I'm supposed to be doing in this work. So Does any, any, anybody else what we can do for them. I mean, what can we do for them for five more weeks? Laura, did you want to speak? Yes. Um, I care about those students too. And I guess my response to that is I know that our staff and are bending over backwards to help as many kids they, as I can in groups and individually and in, in a myriad of ways that I'm sure I don't even know about. But here, here's my take on that. A lot of this talk and a lot of our, the focus of our community has been on the six of us and our superintendent. And, you know, at some point I got to ask myself, what is our community ready to do for these kids? Apparently they're not willing to wear masks a lot of the time or to adapt their behavior in any way that would help get their, these students back in school. So while we're struggling and doing everything we can to, to help these children through this pandemic at every grade level, I guess I would ask, my, you know, ask our fellow citizens, um, you know, what are you willing to do? And in and, and, and what ways are you willing to help? Um, and to our other elected officials, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice? Um, I mean, our, our, our district is embedded in our community in a lot of different ways, but I feel like we are doing a lot of heavy lifting on, on any given day. And, um, and every single one of us cares about those kids. Of course we do. So, you know, my, my, at some point I, I, I want to turn that around to other people and say, okay, can you help us? Can you modify your behavior and not go to, to bars, um, you know, during the, co uh, during the Packer game? Um, because that is, that is affecting community spread. And community spread is dominating how we do our work now. And it has been for months. So that's my take on that. So is, okay, and... Hard to argue with that, but nevertheless, we still have five more weeks of the students that we're speaking about who are out of schools. I just, it's five weeks. Go ahead, Brenda. I think, I mean, I did narrow the, I brought the high school kids in a week earlier um, because I felt like that was shortening the time that they had to wait. I do think, like, to, um, you know, our high school um, and uh, our secondary teachers have have worked um, very hard to, you know, meet students and and uh, interact with students in unique ways and things like that. I know it's not perfect. I know we've got kids coming in now for. I mean, we opened up our our co curriculars. Um, just got a couple. We we all got emails from 
uh, show choirs that, that are now um, having practice. Uh, we've got lab classes and, and classes that are in person. Um, I think there's a lot of things we've done to try to mitigate the, I know it's obviously we all want the kids back in school, but I think we've done some things to mitigate. And I also think that sometimes when you're in a situation that's, that's, uh, that you don't like and you're frustrated and you see no end, it, it feels like, you know, how am I ever going to survive this? And I think just having a date that it gives them something to shoot for. Um, I think that helps. Obviously, it, you know, they still have to do the virtual work that they're struggling to do. But um, I guess I'm just not knowing how much, um, the, knowing that our high school students and middle school students aren't going to be vaccinated. I feel like I'm, I'm just not comfortable bringing um, students back in person um, before that time. So ultimately we weigh, right? We, we're weighing that. It, it just always feels like we're weighing what we're afraid might happen with what's actually happening. And that's, that's, it's just frustrating to hear that knowing how these, a lot of these students are not doing well mentally, physically, and academically. And that other school districts have recognized this and they've brought them back. And, and I have faith that we, we can, I don't, know why we wouldn't entertain possibly a little bit earlier, just something a little earlier. Go ahead, Andrew. So there's, um, there's a couple things. Um, and one was an oversight that I should have caught when we did the last gating motion, but I know we were thinking mostly about high school as being cases where there might be um, specialty reasons to, you know, to have a class come back and to have that application process. I didn't realize we defined it to only be nine through 12. And I think the application process might be a better way to get students. If, if we wanted to try to do something for, um, some bilingual students or special needs students, that might be an easier way to do it because right now all we have is IEP is an as written, as written the plan says that students whose IEPs require on site are the only ones who are gonna go into that category. And we all, we, we all know that that is not a simple or quick process and there's a lot of give and take on that and just convening the meeting and finding everyone's time to do that is problematic. So I, I don't know that there's a good structure right now in what we've created that would allow, for example, a bilingual class to have a couple of, of meetings or to have some of these smaller groups of kids who need more help. I don't know I don't know how that happens at all outside of, um, I guess, outside of 912, and I'm probably going to want to get something into a, a motion about it later to allow, to at least allow all grade levels to fill out that application. But is there is there more to it? Because I think, I think the idea of some contact of in person sometimes has come across as important to a lot of people. That's why people are at the secondary level supportive of AB models and, and this kind of thing. So where, um, yeah, where are we with, um, with that? Like what options are actually available to get maybe kids in sometimes or in small groups or not every day, but to do something before February 15th? So I would offer that, uh, and, and Vicki may want to uh, chime in here, but uh, uh, we've emphasized uh, first uh, returning face-to-face -face, uh, instruction for those classes um, for which it is uh, impossible or difficult to do that work uh, online. And so that has been the priority is to bring them back first 
Uh, we were working to balance the number of kids that are coming into the building uh, in order to ensure that we've got the appropriate spacing out there. Uh, so th that's been the, the thought process um, for uh, the students at the, the high school level. Um, we prioritize high school over middle school uh, simply because uh, the, the sense of urgency of getting the high school students back in. Uh, and so that's been a part of that process. So um, Vicki, I'd, I'd offer it up to you if you've got some more uh, input uh, in response to Andrew. That's accurate, Steve. Plus we've moved to uh, approximately three weeks ago, a model that if it's small group or individual group of students that are struggling, such as you've suggested, mm -hmm. Mr. Becker, that uh, they need not go through the formal face-to-face -face process. We've reserved that for um, academics, as Steve has mentioned, along with uh, athletics and co-curriculars. But smaller groups, students struggling, can go directly through the principal and the supervisor of the school. So we've made that a, a more simplistic process. How many are doing that right now? We aren't tracking that because I suspected it would be a large number. Okay. Good. If we have a lot of small groups, I mean, small groups can be done within all the rules, so that's good. I guess I don't have an I don't have an immediate follow up to that. I I just want to make sure that we're. Um, I mean that that's an you know that's an important I think that's an important piece, and I think you know struggling can mean a lot of different things. Um, I'm sure we're looking most at academically struggling and, and bringing those kids in. So if, if we're in fact having, you know, that it's going to be March 1st before high school is going back, but we have um, some of the kids who are struggling the most are maybe getting a couple meetings a week on, on site. I think that certainly is much better than just you've got Nothing in person until until March first. Go ahead, Laura. Um, I just want to switch the subject a bit here and and um, talk about um, food distribution. Uh, how would this plan affect food distribution to our families who choose to stay virtual? And um, kind of, can you just? Um, Lynette, hi, Lynette. Hello. I just want to talk a little bit about what you see in the future about um, being able to still uh, feed kids. And yeah. most, as many as possible, as much as possible. Yes, absolutely. What we will be doing with um, the food service department when we are in the cohort model, we will still be feeding the students who are virtual and we will still be feeding the students who will be at school. Uh, I have um, talked with all of the administration and with all the executive directors, they have brought me into a meeting and I've worked very closely with all of them. So we, are, we have everything in place to feed the students. Um, we do not want to miss any of the students that are not on our, not in our district, or um, the students that are in our schools. What we will, I'm sorry, keep going. <laughs> well, that is fine. Um, what we are doing is uh, we will be making sure that we are practicing um, safe food handling, sanitation. That is all. Everything has been in place and we have all of the procedures ready and they have been um, emailed out. So we feel very comfortable within the food service department. We've worked very close with health and safety and facilities with us also. I have no doubt that you that can all happen. I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm most concerned about the children who are off site and um, so what will that look like? Will, will, will they still, um, will there still be places where they can pick up their meals? Is that how it's gonna be? Yes, yes. We will still have our feeding locations at our schools. We still have volunteers that 
still want to deliver meals as we have been delivering meals to our families. We uh, also have, I was just actually contacted by um, one of our administrators asking, asking me what the schedule will look like. And I did not send out a schedule. I said that we would hopefully be able to send it out by the end of the week. And that reason is because of what, we what you decide tonight at the board meeting. I didn't want to send something out and then I would have to pull it back in. So we will make sure that we are available. We will be available around the clock. So with that being said, we will be available from the start of the school to the end of the school. We are going to be still feeding breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack for all of our students who are virtual and who are on site. Lynette, you mentioned your volunteers and um, that kind of just triggered this, you know, we, we don't see you that often, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so, and so when we do, I think maybe it went, might not it might be a good time to just sort of remind people of the Herculean effort that has gone into feeding the children in our community and you and your team and your volunteers. Um, I just can't thank you enough. Thank you. Um, and again, it's the team and it's everyone within the district that makes this happen. We, um, the administration team in the, in the district, we are very solid. We work very well together. Um, I am not afraid to reach out if I need assistance or I have to ask a question and I see that vice versa also. So I'm very proud to work with the team I do. And I know Pete Ross is part of that too. And I know he's on this, on this meeting. So I just wanna give him a shout out as well. Thanks yeah. Pete. And the only thing that I would just add is um, Lynette is indicative of any of the operation team lead members that we work with. They're all ready to implement what the board decides and operationalize it. Lynette has done an outstanding job since the beginning of this uh, uh, pandemic that we've all lived through to this point. And uh, her teams have worked extraordinarily hard to deliver many, many, well, millions of meals to uh, area families. So thank you, Lynette. Thank you. Andrew? So are all grade levels able to request to do these small groups right now? Yes, that's correct. Okay, when did we start doing that? Because I've had like, I've gotten from d different, I'm not gonna be any more specific than to say a wide range of grades. I got like a lot of text during this meeting saying I didn't know that was a thing. So sometimes we have good intentions that don't get communicated out as, as wide. Sometimes that, that happens, but if, if, it, if it is available to all grade levels um, and the process is streamlined, then people just need to be checking in with their buildings. Or how do how do they do That's it? As possible, maybe so. I you know I'm I'm not I'm if I'm getting a question sent to me in any format during the meeting, I might I might try to address it. I'm not going back and forth. How long ago was it or something? So, is it fairly recent that we um, streamlined it and and just said that the the buildings could approve it, or has that been that way for a while? No, no, this is fairly new, Mr. Becker. I okay. I thought I had shared it with the board at the last board meeting. I think I'm more just making sure that I, that does sound familiar. I didn't know if it was across all grade levels that it could be. Requested. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Laura. So these are just a couple of things. I've got a pretty long list of questions. Um, two, two kind of um, facilities questions, I think is how are we, um, as far as obtaining HEPA filters, are we pursuing that? Um, and also, how are we in, um, in uh, do we have enough uh, plexiglass and, and things like that that we can um, help um, offer some protection for teachers and, 
and where, where we are able um, to put that in between students or whatever. This can I, is there any way to kind of um, get an update on where those two particular items are? Um, thanks, Laura. Let me start, and I know Mike is chopping on the bit to, to get involved in this meeting as well. Um, as I said before, all of the operation team leaders are actually present at this meeting, viewing the board meeting, um, but we're ready to operationalize what the board would have going forward. Uh, one of the things that I was kind of hoping is that we wouldn't get all of our kids back in a, in a huge wave, but rather in smaller waves. It appears as though the board may choose to have larger waves and we'll be able to work through those issues on an operational aspect and be able to get them into the buildings. Uh, one of the things that I think is, um, is important for the community to know that this district over the last decade, and this, this is way predates me because I've only been around here for a short time, but over the last decade it has really worked hard to um, boost its uh, HVAC systems throughout the entire district, getting them to be very modern, even though some of our buildings are older. Uh, the HVAC systems within the buildings are modern. We're, we're certainly compliant with respect to the air exchanges that are required by um, uh, state code. Uh, we exceed those requirements in all of our buildings and we can jack those up. And I know Mike's got a plan in place to do that. So Mike, I'll let you take it away. Okay, yeah. So as Pete said, uh, we've spent uh, several years now on updating a lot of our mechanical systems. So throughout the district, our air handling and mechanical systems are in very good condition. Um, from, you know, recommendations from uh, the CDC is that um, we use our central um, air handling systems to move the air. Um, they were, they're much more effective than trying to use individual room. Um, air cleaners. Um, most of the small air cleaners that are, are available um, have not been tested as far as the COVID-19 um, to get, you know, um, small ones that do address COVID-19. Um, they're fairly expensive, like around the $800 mark. And we need you know, about 1,500 of those at least throughout the whole district. So the most effective way is to um, use our, our central air um, air handling systems. Um, so what we have done is um, we've made some modifications to the use of our systems. We're starting them um, three hours before students arrive to flush the buildings before anybody enters the building. Um, throughout the building, we're opening our fresh air in, uh, intake dampers 20% uh, additional to bring more fresh air in and exhaust more air. And then at the end of the day, we're um, going through and flushing the buildings again at the end of the day for two hours to get all clean air back into the buildings. Um, the other thing we're doing is normally we replace filters twice a year. Um, we just did it over winter break and then normally we do it during the summer. Uh, once we have students back in the building, we'll be replacing um, filters on a monthly basis. Um, to go talk to about your the plexiglass, um, we built hundreds of shields of plexiglass. Um, most of the ones that we built are going to be used in the main office areas, reception areas, um, those areas. Um, and then we have purchased um, 8,000 8, individual student shields. So those um, we'll be able to use. Um, so if we have our you know, cohorts back in or even 75% um, of our students, you know, that's about, um, you know, 15,000 students we could have in the building. And that would put a, um, a face, uh, individual student shield for every other student. And would that be, all those items, um, can those be uh, funded with uh, CARES Act money? Yes, they have been purchased, and um, I think CARES Act and the other um, money that we received from the government is what we've used to purchase those to date. Well, Pete can answer have, that a little bit better than I can. I have a weird question about these um, individual student um, shields. Just out of curiosity, can you tell me what those cost per unit? I'm just curious. Are, are they very expensive? Or are they, you know... 
I believe the last ones we were ordered were about 20 or $21 a piece. Okay, thank you. I think it's also important for the board to understand that when the pandemic broke out, um, Mike and his teams have been um, you know, really on the ball and on the spot with all kinds of issues, um, you know, going all the way back to March and the school closure and, and his teams have worked very well. Uh, in terms of procuring uh, protective equipment and sanitation equipment and or sanitation supplies and or masking supplies, uh, the, the price of all of that, I, of all of those items has come down uh, at the beginning of this pandemic. They were extraordinarily expensive. Uh, we did purchase some limited supplies to begin with. And as we, you know, uh, went through the summer with the understanding we'd have kids back in school in the fall as, you know, the burden rate was going down and everything was looking good. Um, uh, we had a supply purchase so that we we're ready to start school. Uh, so from an operational perspective, with respect to sanitation equipment or sanitizer, hand wipes, masks, all that stuff is sitting in inventory and we're ready and we're, we'll operationalize that when uh, we get children back to school. But the point of the matter that I do want to make is as we go forward, it's less expensive now and it's more easy to procure. Our procurement specialist um, administrator that we have in charge of procurement, Jake uh, Alverson, has indicated to me that you know we can get most of the stuff now within a week. Uh, so while we have supplies that will last longer than a week, we'll be able to replenish those supplies. Even plexiglass, because I know at one point that was extraordinarily hard to get. Plexiglass as well is easier to get. There's probably a three week lead time on, on individual shields, but we've purchased 8,000, which is almost enough to go one to one, uh, uh, especially if you're bringing back your 612 and cohorts where you're only bringing half the kids back at a time. That's an advantage of the cohort model, certainly. The, la the last shipment of sh shields that we order took us about a week to get so they are and they're they're the student even individual student shields really aren't the technical a plexiglass they're a, they're a plastic type material but it's also important for the board to understand that the number one uh, safety mechanism that we have to everybody has to do it, it not not just our children <laughs> but every single adult, and I wish all of the adults out in the community would as well. You gotta wear your mask. Um, you know, we've seen and we've witnessed open air events all over the country where people are not masked and they're super spreader events. So if you're outside and you have 100% outside air at you all the time, you can still get the uh, virus without wearing a mask. Everybody's got a mask up. Our whole country should be masking. He is correct, the, the shields, do not take place of the masks. Um, they're just a second defense. Um, the masks are the most important. I couldn't agree with you more, Pete. Thank you guys. All right, if there aren't any other board member questions, we can, I, I don't know if there, oh, go ahead, Laura. Um, so I suspect this is going to pass tonight and I, I have some, I have some, a lot of trepidation about this, but the one thing that I, I, I want to talk about is how we are going to, um, cause inevitably there will be, um, people that get infected. they will be spread in our schools. they will be even with teachers, um, vaccinated, um, that, there'll be classrooms that have to be quarantined. And we have a lot of schools and a, a huge amount of students. So I know that the districts around us um, put out their own versions of their information. I would like to, I would like some kind of um, assurance that our data um, is going to be very accurate. I want, I want to know that our public, when they see what ha is happening in our schools as a result of our decisions tonight, um, that they can count on that, that, those numbers to be accurate and dependably, and dependably accurate. Because um, I don't know if that's always the case. 
in other in other um, districts, and I've heard a lot of varying um, varying information about that. Let's put it that way. So, have have you talked, uh, Steve? Have you talked amongst yourself about how we're going to do that, and should we do that by individual school or? Well, how will the t whatever happens tonight change what we're already doing? Sure. So a couple things. So uh, Krista may want to chime in and talk about uh, how we gather information. Uh, and I assume by that you're talking about um, how we know uh, uh, information about who needs to quarantine, who needs to isolate um, among both students and staff. So you've got a, a number associated with it. And then um, Josh has been out looking at dashboards uh, that we, we may want to emulate um, as we model one that allows us to look at uh, both the district as a whole, but then also to look at individual schools um, as we go through that decision making. And so, um, Kristen, I'd, I'd offer you the floor to talk about how we're going to gather that information and how we'll know about uh, those issues for isolation and quarantine. And then, Josh, if you've got any thoughts to add about um, how the, the dashboards may look. Uh, so that people will be able to readily access that. So, Kristen? So one thing I can say is that our data is only going to be as good as what we're supplied with because we don't have a way to run a mass report to know who is actively either testing, quarantine, or isolating. So we need to start with a point of information, a point of contact. Someone needs to let us know. So let's talk about employees because that's probably the easiest because we've been working so much with that. So when we find out that an employee is testing, um, we immediately put them into quarantine until we get their test results. If their test results are negative, they're released. And if they're in isolation because they become positive, we flip them into a different um, category and then have them out the appropriate amount of time for their isolation period. Um, or if they have children that have tested positive and we need to keep someone out for that extended length of time. And um, we've been working extensively with Josh coming up with our own program to really do a great job of monitoring this because Right now we've been working off of spreadsheets and he's come up with a program that we feel is going to really, really help us with that. And even to the point of being able to enter in a classroom, say a student was positive, we can enter all those other students that we need to quarantine literally within minutes. So it, it's super exciting to have that. Um, so there's a lot of follow-up that's being done. Um, our nurses are making a ton of phone calls, even with our students that are currently off-site. If a teacher or um, a, a clerical or someone finds out they're positive, we do follow up with those families currently. But again, as they're off-site at this point, it's hard to get an accurate number because not everyone is, is sharing that information. It'll be a little bit easier when they're on-site because they'll be absent and we can follow up. I can share that the athletic trainers have been doing a great job if a student is missing a practice or a game. They are asking that student why they were missing and then following up. And I, I get phone calls up until nine o'clock at night sometimes saying, hey, Johnny didn't show up tonight. And this is now what he's telling us. And then following up with that family going, please get them tested so we know what's going on and we know that they're safe to return or needing to quarantine. So a lot of legwork, a lot of footwork, um, and but it is only as good as the information that we're provided. Can we use CARES Act money to help um, with that? I'm not sure what that would look like. We have the ability, um, Laura, to use CARES Act money for solving issues with respect to COVID, absolutely. One of the things that we're trying to do, especially when it comes to purchasing what we need to have our kids in school safely as we can possibly make it, uh, is to use other resources as well um, uh, than just the CARES Act money because we believe that we're going to need additional personnel when we have our children back in school. And that's going to go on not only this year, but next year as well. We have until October of 2022 to do our final claim for the CARES Act so we can spend money all the way up into that time. And it's, it's hopeful that there will be resources available so that we can have additional hands as we have our children back in school so that they can be more successful. 
Thank you. Mo you know, mostly just my concern with this is that our district is known for as a district that puts out accurate information and that our community can look to our district and on our website and know that what they're seeing is accurate and, an, you know, uh, um, as up to date as possible. I know it's hard. It's very hard, I'm sure. Up to date as possible on the information that they're seeing. Um, I just can't. We're such. We have such a big in, uh, footprint in our community, and we have so many people in our buildings that I feel like this will be a very, very important part of the work going forward. Yeah, and through, that's why right. board request, uh, Laura and Mr. Murley had asked uh, Angela and I to put together a report I'll give at the next board meeting with respect to what we've spent so far, what resources we've used, what resources are available, uh, so that there'll be a clear understanding. Uh, one of the things that I want to be very cautious to the community about is that, you know, when we claim to receive our reimbursement from the CARES Act, We'll do so on a quarterly basis. So uh, we've only put in one quarter so far uh, with the CARES funds. Everything that we've purchased would be on that um, uh, claims report, and I'll have a report for the board so you can view that. We're in the process of putting together our second quarter claim for the CARES Act, and that may be available at the time of the board meeting as well. Pete, I have a question about that. Pete? Go ahead, Rhonda. Yeah. Uh, what's the balance on our CARES Act avail available funds? Like what? What? Could yeah, I, I'm going to give you the uh, the amount of money that we have in our CARES fund at 7.9 million, of which we have to share about 450 thousand or so with the private schools. We've done a claim of 710 thousand um, already, and I can provide you with that detailed claim uh, in the report I'll give to the board. Uh, um, on the 25th, you'll have that information. So um, we're getting ready to file our second quarter claim. Uh, I don't have the detail on that yet, but I think that claim is gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars. Okay, so we were given the 7.9 million. You said we have to share how much with the private schools? Well, 450,000 gets shared with the private schools. So but the rest is ours. Yeah, and that's CARES Act and it's GEARS Act money. Um, but I have to caution the board because there's never a simple explanation when it comes to school finance for some reason. Um, we purchased about $485,000 worth of per, uh, per protective equipment and sanitation supplies and sanitation equipment using what we thought was going to be reimbursed from the federal government through FEMA. FEMA put out um, the, the request for schools to submit claims for reimbursement uh, to that organization when we first were, um, you know, working through some of the throes of the coronavirus to begin with. So we put our claim in and have heard nothing from the federal government. We're all disappointed and it's not just um, Green Bay schools, it's our neighbors as well who also put in um, a FEMA requests. So uh, we're concerned that there may not be any reimbursement through FEMA, especially since it's been crickets um, so we may have to divert some of that uh, to the CARES resources. Was there a reason why you didn't go through the CARES Act to begin with? Uh, we're trying to utilize all other resources to provide uh, enough funds for the CARES to last through the entire two years of the program. Again, uh, we have until um, October of 2022 to spend the money. And did I hear you say correctly, you can actually purchase or you can acquire personnel with that, those funds? Yes, you can. Okay. If it's COVID related. So remediation, mental health services, nursing, all of those things that would be COVID related, you can use. Mm -hmm. Contract tracers. Yep. Go ahead, Brenda. Um, Steve, if... Uh, if this passes tonight um, and uh, this doesn't have a gating criteria on it, um, what kind of, uh, this kind of tags in with, with Laura, you know, what, what kind of metrics have you thought about that will, that we can follow and track and maybe Kristen can, can weigh in too, um, that are going to be important for us to follow and track um, in terms of are we doing okay? Can we stay open? You know, th th those, ki those kinds of questions. I mean, I know we'll have 
individual uh, classrooms who are quarantined and, and things like that. But I'm, I'm looking more at the big picture of, of um, making sure that we're keeping track of the right things so we know that we're staying safe and can remain open as a district. Sure. So we've looked at a lot of different uh, dashboards in particular, and, and Josh is live on the screen right now, and I'm going to ask him to jump in here and just uh, share some of the data points from some of those dashboards that we've looked at. Sure. Um, and you, you're right. If there's the proposal on the table here eliminates the gating criteria, but I'm assuming that last clause in your motion, Brenda, for the administration to develop criteria for transition to virtual learning due to co transmission of COVID is coming up with some kind of alternate criteria to know when to close and, and things like that. Um, we've seen the, the most compelling one that I've seen is actually um, from Hudson, Wisconsin. Um, that takes a look at both the burden rate and the rate of infection within the school community itself. Um, so you can have in-person school with a high community rate as long as your school community rate is low. Or if the community rate is very low, but you're having an outbreak at a school that, um, that triggers a set of actions. Um, we, would, we would match our dashboard though to um, to, to whatever, you know, the, it's the job of the administration, obviously, to, to bring back this criteria for when we transition back to virtual. I'm assuming that's going to be board approved as well. Um, and we would design our dashboards around that. I'm confident that we have the data to do that at the building level uh, for both employees and students. As Kristen said, we, are we have developed um, a single system um, that, that allows both, um, cases to be managed for both students and staff. Um, and we get granular data down to um, the building level along with the length of quarantine and isolation and, and things like that. So that's information, uh, the spread within the school community is, is information we're going to be able to, um, to accurately, we'll be able to accurately provide a picture of, of people that have disclosed what's going on with them with, with respect to COVID. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Dawn and then Andrew. Okay, now Josh, I'm gonna put my IT hat on um, because I've been looking at a lot of dashboards too. And one thing I found really helpful was Howard Swamico has a really nice little graph um, with their historical data on there. Um, a lot of schools don't. So um, that just a plug, I really like that. It paints a pretty clear picture of kind of how things how things progress through fall and you can see at what point they closed and what happened to the numbers there. So um, I would like to see some kind, it doesn't have to be, you know, drill in detail, but have some kind of historical data or graphing available that, that you can that, watch that trending. That's on our current uh, district dashboard too, at the district level, we don't have yeah. that broken down at the building level. And that gets to be a challenge too, just from a sheer real estate perspective, when you've got 42 schools, as opposed to what the nine or whatever that. Yeah, no. And I don't think it needs to be, I don't think you'd need to have historical historical data to graphing, but yeah, it would be having that I think is important. Go ahead, Andrew. So, um, well, I do support some moves to get us, to get us back sooner. I'm also pretty committed to not leaving tonight with nothing nothing in place that says this is what returns us to virtual. And I, I can't see how I can vote for a plan that says that we'll find out later what the rules are that would force a return to virtual if, if COVID spiked. Um, I, I've been studying this a lot. I, I think it's very likely that we will not climb back up where we were before because and I mean, one thing is that unfortunately so many people have had it and then, but also with the vaccine starting to come into play, I, I don't think it's likely we'll see those huge numbers again, but if we did, um, and while I'm certainly open to something that is a combined model of community cases and school district cases like, like Hudson, that that makes sense. Uh, I think, I think it's important that there at least be 
some kind of a check-in process. So until something new is available, uh, people can know that there are there are still rules because otherwise we end today with a decision that cases could theoretically be back at 2000 and there's nothing in this motion that would say that we stop. And I, I'm just, I'm not voting yes on something and then waiting for what is, what are the safety rules? I think we have to start. I think we have to have something there that is a mandatory trigger of virtual and then if you want to come back with a new formula, hopefully sooner than later, we could do that too. You know, can I just ask a cl clarifying question? Yeah. Uh, so if we were to adopt a, a ceiling, if you will, uh, that, that was an automatic trigger for virtual, um, would you still presume that, that uh, uh, to, to have delegated to the administrative team the, the process of uh, dealing with individual classrooms and schools um, that may have other criteria other than that ceiling um, to determine when those classrooms or schools may need to be um, off-site. Yeah, I think, I, I guess I'm talking about, sure, if there's, if there's a situation where the district is, the district is doing well, but there's a, a school that there's an out-of-control outbreak, sure, I, I remember, um, well, it must have been about, I'd have to look at what the day of the week was, but like one of the, well, the last Wednesday before spring break, I think, I think Brenda and I had a meeting with, um, with Michelle and I remember talking about, yeah, would we be closing like a whole school then if there were more than a few cases or would we be just sending the, and of course then that was probably about March 13th and then things, you know, dramatically took a turn. I certainly would, you know, yeah, and I, I, sure. If there's a um, out of control outbreak at, at a building, but I think there has to be some place and it, Again, I, I would I would like to see the refinement that could come from probably before the opening date of hey here's how we're going to look at a a combination of of things, but I think there needs to be some kind of absolute ceiling at least until it's replaced by something else, and I think that's I think that's reasonable, and I I think it's um, I think it needs to be something that people can. Um, you know, look at and know that we're checking, you know, we're checking this number weekly uh, to determine what happens the next week. And I, if a new gating criteria comes in, I think it should also be, we need to say what day of the week we're checking and that it's effective for a week from today or, or something like that. Go ahead, Brenda. I guess I'm, <clears throat> I'm intrigued, Josh, by the, um, dashboard you described from um, Huron, is that what you said? Hudson, Hudson. Hudson. Um, and uh, cause I'm a little bit, you know, we've, I've been uh, hoping at some point that we will get really specific guidelines from either our public health uh, in Wisconsin or CDC. Um, and I, I don't really, I don't have not seen any entity come out with gating numbers that say, um, you know, this is when you have to close. This is your top number, you have to close no matter what. Um, I know CDC originally put out their, their numbers. Um, those numbers really just told us what risk there was. Um, I'm surprised those numbers haven't changed because I think we know more about the spread in schools and the risk in schools and things like that. Um, so I'm, if I, I wouldn't know, um, you know, I, I, what I don't want to have happen is that we pick a number that says we have to close, but we look at our school data and we're not having any trouble. We're, we're doing well. We're following mitigation. People, uh, you know, we have teachers vaccinated. We, everybody's been careful. Everybody's been good. And even though the community spread is high, um, we're doing okay. And I don't want, I want it to be I want to be able to evaluate how we're doing in our schools. I don't want to have an automatic um, number where we shut down at this point, unless, I mean, I know we have transition of 
uh, government tomorrow and I know there's going to be a plan coming out and there may be a number um, some numbers attached to that that are that are more specific but um, at this point th anyway that's I'll stop there Go ahead, so I hate to throw a curveball in the works here, folks, but I just have to share this with you. Um, I was just notified that apparently uh, the government, uh, Wisconsin state government, has uh, uh, put a little wrench in the works here. Um, they've approved that those over 65 uh, in the 1B group are going to go before teachers. Uh, and so they are in line to get vaccinated before our staff do. Um, they will fill most of the slots for the next two weeks. Uh, and uh, even though the providers are working really hard to open uh, uh, new uh, uh, testing slots as fast as they can, uh, it's likely that because it's a first come first serve basis and because those over 65 are now in line uh, in front of teachers that um, we probably are not going to see our, our education staff um, being vaccinated uh, for the next two weeks. I am sorry to share that it literally just came in. So Steve, if I'm looking at my calendar, that would have our staff being vaccinated the first week in February, potentially as the earliest. I'm presuming that's the case. Um, so I, I think it's two weeks from now. I'm not sure if that means uh, two weeks. The 1B was slated to start uh, in a rolling process, but most significantly next week on the 25th. Uh, so I'll be honest with you, I don't know enough about this, Dawn, to know if that's if that's uh, our teachers being in line for, uh, um, uh, let's, I'm trying to look at my dates here, whether we're in line the week of March 1st or whether in line we're in line the week of March 8th. Okay. So if it's two weeks from today, tech, it would technically be that first week in February for the first dose. And then the last week in February for the second is what we would be looking at if it's two weeks from today. But we don't know if it's two weeks from today or two weeks from next week. Yeah, that's right. I, I literally just got this. So I, I have not had a chance to do any more investigation yet. Okay. So sorry for that bad news. I just want to make sure that you had that as you were wrapping up your conversation tonight. Um, I saw Andrew and then Laura. Right. So I, I guess I still, it's too big of a, it's too big of a jump for me to go from, we will open based on, based on when COVID is lower to, we will, I, I'm, I'm okay with trying opening based on a date, but I need, uh, I, I think for me to support, there has to be, at least until something more refined is available, I think there has to be some kind of safety valve that if we're at an extreme level of community cases, um, it, 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 se it seems to me that even people who supported a much quicker return to school perhaps started saying not so fast when we were over the 1,000 level of case burden. I guess I would throw that. I would throw that out there as perhaps a point that would. Um, and again, we're we're below it. We're well below it. I don't think I, I, I'm optimistic that we'll never see that again. But I think to to leave tonight saying we have completely removed the level of COVID from any formal decision process. That's that's speaking of someone who is generally associated for what it's worth with you know wanting to maybe try to get back sooner than some. I think I'm kind of a centrist on the issue, but yeah, I I, I can't see there being nothing related to COVID. And as you know, I've been clear about it before. Pass it today, and we'll refine it later. Is something I can't. I can't do either because I don't know what the leader is going to say. Brenda and then Rhonda. Um, yeah, Andrew, I was talking about uh, the Hudson model combines um, case burden and uh, school data. Um, and so I would like it to be a combination. 
I, rather than an absolute number. Yeah, we just can't. I don't think we can have that tonight, and I'm not willing to leave tonight without something unless you're proposing we would do the Hudson model adopted. There, theirs would have to be scaled for the size of our district, though. And also, yeah. I, I don't know. I think the Hudson model, they're doing much better with COVID there. And I think the community, the community access of it doesn't go remotely close to where, where we are either. I, I, on my first look. So, Andrew, if I hear you correctly, what you'd like to do is, is amend the motion on the table to add something like uh, and an automatic trigger to shut down at X burden rate, um, it, which will be replaced when the administration comes forward with a new plan. Is that what you're saying? You just want something in place when we leave here today to get us to, between the gap of today and when we move next time. Is that correct? Yeah, but I think the, I think the board has to approve whatever the next thing is i don't think the administration can remove the so it couldn't be it couldn't say uh, <clears throat> with virtual being virtual being re-triggered at blank until the administration revises it it would have to be until the board which i think i think would happen before school would start but the problem is especially being in a 3-3 situation i i don't want to be stuck at I don't want to be stuck. I want people to know that there's, I want people to have who are, and it's, it's not that anybody thinks one is important and one is unimportant, but for those, those who have asked me to look first at COVID safety, I need to be able to tell them that at, at least there is an emergency trigger in there till we come up with something more refined and that's that's an important valid uh, valid point. Okay. Uh, Rhonda and then Laura. So Andrew, are you saying that this would just trigger a virtual response or an emergency board meeting to discuss next steps? Well, I think there's. To, to me, uh, I mean, I think there would be times you, you might call for an, for me, I guess the emergency board meeting maybe comes in if, say we picked a thousand, if, if we're below, a, if, if we're, if we're hanging around, you know, below that or well before that, and then we reach the, the check date, which is Monday and it's 700, it's been hovering. And then all of a sudden on Tuesday, it's 800, Wednesday, it's 900, but the official check day was Monday. To me, that kind of a spike is what would trigger the emergency board meeting when it's something unusual is happening between the cut date and the um, and the current. Um, okay, can I just hold on? So, what I want to understand though is that are you asking, are you, or what is on the table that it would be a board meeting would be triggered, or the administration would just reverse course. I, I, I want to understand who's making I, I the decision just, and at what point. I think I think I, I think uh, I think an absolute decision has to be made by numbers and if the administration wants us to do something other than the numbers then they have to do an emergency board meeting. Um that, that's where well, the board does not I guess in my hearing that the board has no it can be triggered without a board board meeting, basically. Well, right. I want people because uh, I don't want people to. Yeah, I, I think they're just like we were trying to do with with gating criteria. Uh, we were trying to get people to be able to look and know what's happening and know where things are going. So I, I'd also like people to be able to look to look at our dashboard and see. Oh, geez, we're on the bubble of maybe having to go virtual, that's important for families to plan as opposed to, oh, the numbers are high, there will be a board meeting. And I get uh, that, but I, what I want to understand and what the, really the qu only thing I need you to answer is when would the board meeting happen and why? 
I would think the administration would ask for an emergency board meeting, either if we were they don't over... have to, but they don't have to. Right, Is but we can. We can. I mean, two members can. Two members can request. The president can call a special. Two board members can sign a paper to call a special. It's it's not that it's not that hard. It's not that hard to get. I mean, if if what others really prefer is an auto trigger for an emergency board meeting, um, I mean that might be you know that might be okay. I just want I just want people to know that if we're if we shoot back up to you know if we shoot back up, God forbid, to the fourteen fifteen hundred level we were at before, we're even most of the people most strongly in favor of opening were saying something a little different to me. They were saying, I get that it's not yet, but I'd like to get back quickly when it starts to go down. I think we all heard probably some of those when it was really at its bad peak in November. Um, yeah, I don't, I want people to know that there is a point that there's a point where things are just so bad that we would hit the we would hit the pause for a week, just like we're okay, preemptively. Okay, so what is that point? A, what is that point? I would think, I would think for sure, if we hit a thousand, it should. Uh, if if we hit a thousand on a weekly check, it should trigger the pause button for a week. What is the pause button for a week, though? I mean, so it would trigger but, virtual. It would trigger virtual for a week if we if we went over a thousand on the check date so on if we hit if we were over a thousand on a monday it would make the following week virtual but if it's a if administration had some findings that it's you know what yeah the community spread is bad but look how low it's been in the schools everyone's doing what they're supposed to do emergency board meeting and we we waive it if if a thousand isn't a serious problem anymore that and I'm talking about, I don't think we're ever going to get to a thousand. We probably will not get to a, a thousand again, but I. I'm actually not be... concerned about the numbers. as I am about the process to actually make a decision because it seems very all over the place. So. Um, yeah. So I think special circumstances like. It was under, it, it didn't reach the trigger, but things are looking very bad for some special reason in the last couple of days. I think that's where you have to do the emergency board meeting route. But I think I think there should be an automatic trigger somewhere. And I think that's probably a weekly check of, of 1,000, which will probably be replaced before the schools even open by something else. But I'm just not leaving anything as, willing to leave anything as, undecided or we'll get back to you or admin will write the rules, especially in a three, three board. I'd like to know how, what Brenda thinks about that. Um, I'm wondering if we can ask our administration actually to go back and look at this and bring something forward next week. Um, I, I mean, I, I think you, you have to decide if you like this motion and, and realize then that next week we would have the ability to have input as to what the metrics are going to be. I don't know that we're going to solve this problem tonight. I do understand the emergency board meeting proposal. Um, you know, I think it's important that we have the uh, ability to assess that. Um, and again, I, I mean, going back to, I don't want I want the board to be able to assess it because if we reach a thousand and things are good, then we might do something different than just close the schools. Um, so if we had a top number and it triggered a board meeting instead of closing the district, I'd be good with that. <clears throat> okay, I'll probably, I'll probably add that, that myself. Oh, that okay, would be I mean, a board I'm, meeting, not a, okay, not a virtual re response. Do you know what the timetable is for an appointment process? Because being in a 3-3 situation is kind of relevant at a critical time. I mean, I think usually it's been around a month or so. Well, is actually developing that timeline and we'll bring it forward to the, the next meeting. I don't know if she has it done right now, but I guess from my standpoint, I'll just, uh, if I could just offer a thought on it, you know, if the idea is that 
um, when we reach a ceiling, uh, in this case, Andrew's suggesting a thousand, um, that when we reach a ceiling, uh, either one of two things would happen. Either we would automatically move to a week of virtual instruction or uh, it would trigger an emergency uh, board meeting uh, in order to determine the next steps. Uh, if that's coupled with the idea that we will develop uh, those dashboards internally and then apply those locally at the school and classroom level, uh, I think that's certainly something that we as an administrative team can work within. And Melissa, I thought uh, I'd just say, come on, if you'd like to add anything on the timeline for the appointment, just to help them as they think through this. Thanks. Um, Beth and I um, had an opportunity to meet last week and actually Sandy was working as well. So she was able to join us. We looked back at the last two timelines for the appointments and we will be bringing forward a um, proposed schedule for similar timeline for this appointment. If um, everything is approved as we have it proposed, there would be an individual appointed to the seat prior to spring break. So that uh, we have to have it filled within 60 days of the vacancy and the vacancy started last Friday with Christi Christina's resignation. Okay, so I, um, thank you. I, emergency, yeah, um, yeah, this, this puts me in a difficult spot because I have made a, well, I would like to, well, I don't think I've seen anything unreasonable here. I've made a, a strong and very public commitment that COVID levels would not would not be completely removed from something that I would vote for, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll pass for now, and I still have to think about it a little bit more. And I, I don't I think if it's an, if it's emergency board meeting, and not a hard number, then I think the the number might might have to be different um but I'll, I'll pause for the moment and listen to others go ahead laura so i agree with you andrew i i don't want to vote on this without some um some kind of number that our community can't go beyond as far as community spread because i don't think you can just cordon off our uh our students and staff and and you know, we don't function in a vacuum in our schools. So um, putting all these bodies and these humans back into these buildings, um, you know, we, we don't really know yet what that's going to cause as far as spread or how it will contribute. And also now with this new information um, about um, this uncertainty about when our teachers can start the vaccination process, um, I... I don't know if I can vote for this tonight, so. Go ahead, Donna. Brenda, would, I mean, can we amend the motion to take into account four weeks after teachers get their first vaccine, their first vaccination? Um, I, I, I'm not sure how we do this. I mean, I, I support this if it's based off of teachers getting their two doses of the vaccination. So yeah, I mean, I we can, we can amend it to say whatever, whatever we want. Um, I mean, yeah, like I said, originally, yeah, it's kind of what I was thinking, but I put dates in to make it easier for people to follow. Well, um, and I, and I like that too, because, um, you know, maybe that puts a little pressure down in Madison for them to prioritize our teachers and get them vaccinated. Um, I know they're very interested in us opening our schools and it puts a little bit of the otis on them. So I, that would be my recommendation. Um, regarding a ceiling, I, I just, I want somebody to give us a number. It sounds like Andrew, you want, Andrew, Laura, you want to have a number to vote on this? And, and I'm fine. I, I mean, I guess I wonder what you want that number to be. And um, I like Brenda's idea, Steve. I mean, you know, you, you all go back and figure out, I like the idea of looking both at burden and looking at what our schools look like, because, um, you know, it, 
everything we get we get data out and things are changing all the time right and we are we're getting stuff in new york city you know they last week i read an article that said they had to close 400 schools but what they saw was that the spread was lower in the schools than it was in the community so i do think um looking at both what the climate is within our schools and what's going on long term is the best thing but um if we need a number to pass this tonight then somebody put a number out there that we can replace once the admin comes back with something for us to approve to replace it with. Can, can ahead, we get the current motion? Absolutely, I can share my screen. Okay. Are you able to see it? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Andrew, are you thinking on something? I'm, think I'm thinking about it, yeah. Okay. If other people want to, it's going to take me a while to try to write something up here. If other people have other things to to talk about, I do. I do have a question, Steve. What does busing look like? I mean, has that changed at all? So let's say we, let's say it's two weeks from, it's two weeks from today, and we are able to hit that March first date in order to bring everybody back. Um, what does busing look like for our students? I mean, with the with the co with the cohorts for our secondary, um, we'll have fewer students on our buses, right? Yeah, and I uh, I know Chad's on the call with us. I can't see him on the screen right now. The way it's set up, but uh, I would, I just I'd open it up. up. I I can't see it on the screen either because the screen is being shared. So so I just opened up my window. You know, just like any of the other operations team members, transportation would be ready to execute, you know, the, the requirements of the board. I think one, one thing that I'm very concerned about with respect to transportation, though, is that parents have to have the understanding that it's, it's you know, with kids getting on and off the bus, obviously we'll load the bus as kids get on from the back going forward and as they go off from forward going back. But it, we're, it's going to be almost impossible to social distance. Uh, and no school district in the area is social distancing effectively with the school buses. It's just not possible. Uh, there's not enough equipment and there's not enough drivers. Now, having said that, if we have 30% of our children that are choosing to have virtual learning, that will really help. Um, but we'll put on as many routes as we possibly can and we'll do the best job that we can. And that's all we can do. Right, and, and just to add, um, also as uh, Pete mentioned, uh, certainly some of the routes will be uh, a, a few more students, some will be lighter. It'll just uh, be dependent on each school and um, you know what that might look like. So we'll do the best we can for sure. Thank you. I'm gonna, should I email my suggested language to Beth so you can copy paste it? That would be there. Wonderful. Is that the easiest or what's easiest? Yep, if you could email my way, that would be great. Are there any um, final questions? I mean, obviously Andrew's motion will get made here, but just wondering if we can get into a direction of uh, being ready to vote on a motion. I have one other thing. Well, that could be probably answered while I'm writing because maybe it's it's already been considered. Making the vaccine as easy as possible to get. Have we considered? Uh, we're a big 
we're a big place. Have we, are we going to be able to have maybe some district related sites for, our, for people to get the vaccine for for staff to get the vaccine? I've had some worry about, okay, am I going to have to worry about if I'm one of the first 300 to call for an, for an appointment or, um, you know, that kind of thing. So we're doing a couple of things. So we're working with Purvey and Bellin uh, through their mass vaccination sites. We're also looking through, uh, working through the vendor who does our flu vaccines. And I see that Melissa and Kristen are both live on the screen here. So we've been working with VaxPro who did our flu vaccination clinic this year at West that went very, very well. They have been approved as a vendor to administer the vaccine. However, just as Ballon and Purveya are bound by the classifications that the state has put together, so would VaxPro. So they will not get that vaccine until we have gone through the groups as Steve noted tonight. And with the announcement of the age 65 and older getting it first, um, I think that date's gonna be pushed back even further. They did email us again today and asked us um, if we needed anyone in the 1A group to get vaccinated. We've taken care of that with Prevea. So we're gonna have to just wait uh, to get to that 1B group and where our teachers line up. And then that will be an additional source that we can do on site for our staff. Brenda, did you have one more? I just, I was curious who, uh, you may have said this to you when you first started talking about it, but um, who who's the final decision maker on the priority in the 1B group? So we get that from the state. Uh, and I know uh, Kristen is on, uh, and actually was able to confirm uh, uh, in the gap here that uh, uh, the, uh, the senior 1B group starts next Monday, the 25th. So as you start counting forward, Dawn, it's not today, it's next Monday um, when you look at dates, but uh, that information is determined at the state level. Uh, I did work with the other superintendents of the, the other four large districts in the state to send a, a letter uh, to the governor imploring him to put educators first. Uh, and, and we just sent that letter out earlier this week or late last week, so I guess uh, I'm a little disappointed. Um, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I have an 81 year old mother who was on that list of those over 65. Um, so obviously happy to hear that uh, she's going to be in line to get that. But um, frustrated that our, our teachers aren't first, uh, and uh, with the recognition how important the vaccine is to help get our staff back uh, into school with our kids safely. I have received Andrew's proposed amendment to the motion. If, would you like to see it? Sure. So then I'll I'll make I'll I'll move the the amendment. Um, Can we see it first? Yeah. yeah. Well, so he's going to move. He'll move. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to I I move to amend the current motion by adding the following. Should the Brown County case burden reach 1,000 cases per 1,000 population per 14 days, an mm -hmm. emergency board meeting shall be called regarding learning models. Can I, and I would just offer uh, in support to Andrew, uh, if he's talking about that just from a data standpoint, that we do track this on a daily basis, and so it wouldn't necessarily be a waiting till Monday to find out type of thing. So just in FYI, I apologize. I think I stepped on some of these. I think if, if we were, if it was going to be a hard number, it would have to be a check date. But I think if it's an emergency board meeting, it's just, it's just, if we hit, it. I don't think we'll hit it. I, I, I think we probably won't hit it. And this might be replaced with something else in a relatively short period of time, but it's, it's so it's allowing us to say that there is, um, there, there is, something in there about COVID burdens. So do we need to take a vote to add? Well, we don't have a second. Is anybody? I would like to offer some feedback on this. Well, um, don't, don't offer feedback until there's a second. Um, I'll second to for conversation. Okay. Now um, you can make your comment, Laura. Okay. So if we, uh, oh, it went away. 
Look, um, if we have a burden rate of 1,000 cases per 100,000 for 14 days, that's the same stat we've been. I mean, I'm just use cut. I'm just continuing the same stat that we've been using all along. Yes. Okay. We would be in emergency mode as a community, I think. And I think our school should reflect that. Um, so 14 days seems, I would rather see that be, you know, maybe seven days. And um, I am not actually comfortable with 1000 cases. I think it should be less. So um, I don't know if anyone else has um, any, and also I'm, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with knowing what we just learned about um, the schedule for vaccines for our teachers with what is currently here. I'd like it to be pushed back. I, you know, part of me wonders if we could vote on this on Monday. We will know more about these vaccinations then and, um, and maybe even get some feedback from people. But I, I, know we've, I know we've had a lot of feedback. Don't get me wrong. I know what, I'm, I mean, I know what that means by saying that. But um, I, I, I would have a very hard time um, voting yes on this schedule because the, you know, the vaccination schedule is pretty much, uh, um, I'm not, uh, I can't really get past that. I um, That's a non-negotiable for me. Yes. So frankly, Laura, I think we have to take a vote tonight. Um, after everything that we've gone through, calling a special meeting, moving it up, everything that's happened. Um, and if it fails, it fails. And then we have to go back to the drawing board. But it, I, I don't feel comfortable pushing this off. Uh, I get it. But I feel like we're really, really close. You know what I mean? Like we're close. I'm just not... Um, this new information about vaccines has really put a, a, you know, I'm troubled by that. There's no guarantee when those vaccines are coming. And I know we have a lot of people anxiously watching that. I think we have a lot of people anxiously watching that, but we really don't have a definitive number about how many people are actually going to get the vaccine in order to put everything that we're doing in a contingency mode on that one topic. We have to vote tonight. We cannot spin our wheels anymore. Right. Kids, there are kids waiting. There are kids watching this. They need to know that they're a priority as well. So do we need to take a vote to add Andrew's amendment? Uh, we do, although, although there is a good... Um, No, I'm going to leave it where the re here's the <clears throat> the reason why I, I was I was thinking do do we switch it to a, a a seven day rate? I again I think if it's not if it's not at a thousand that automatically triggers the meeting, but we can see something very terrible has happened in the last week. Admin can call it. Eric can call it. Two board members can call it. The idea of 14 is it kind of gives you an idea of how what percentage of the community has has COVID. So if if you're if you, when you're over a thousand, we're talking about a situation, and and that's as it shakes out. Just if you're thinking more in terms of what life was like at a particular time, we reached a thousand. We reached a thousand on basically. This is basically where we were October and November, and then right away in December we started to improve. So we're talking about if we reach the if we touch the October or November levels, and those are months when a lot of people were telling me I support opening, maybe not yet. That's where I started hearing some of that. Um, at least at least it's um, it's something. So. That I'm going to stick with that as my amendment. It's been seconded. It's it's not perfect, but it also doesn't leave us in a situation where we have completely removed the COVID level in the community from the from the discussion, and that's important. All right, um, Beth, do you have the ability to? Or do you want us to do a voice vote on just on Andrew's amendment? 
we can take an online vote or a voice vote. Okay, if you're if you can do online, then let's do that. So this is just on adding Andrew's amendment to the motion. Exactly, and online voting has been open. Mm. Although the online vote states the whole motion, we're voting on the amendment. Correct, just that bottom line. If it's not coming up on my phone, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I'm going to be a yes. Thank you. And Beth, I was on the public site, not authentic site, so or the authentic cake site, so I'm a yes. Thank you. And then Rhonda, I'm just waiting for you. You're, you're mute. She said, yeah, she said she she said she's a yes, but Rhonda, you were muted, so we didn't hear it. I said if this gets us to pass something, I'm a yes. Thank you. All votes have been entered and the motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. Okay. Um, Andrew, you got something yeah, else? Yeah, I have, I have one more thing. And this, this I'm just hearing, uh, I'm, I'm hearing a, a lot of it. Uh, I had a couple people ask me about it just now, but it's not new tonight. It's, it's, it's been there for, for a while. The idea of, the idea of the new sixth graders and the new ninth graders uh, coming back a little bit earlier, I, I guess I'd like to have some some discussion about that and a and a possible um, a possible amendment um, that maybe now and maybe Andrew, maybe before you proceed with that, sorry to interrupt, but I'll just uh, offer that I know that that has been a hot topic of conversation with the team, uh, and I know that uh, Vicky and Judy are both uh, online with us, and I know that uh, they've had extensive conversation with uh, the building administrators about um, how to best meet the needs of those kids. And so, uh, perhaps before you go any further, we could just invite them to to share the thinking and, and some of the conversations that's taken place around uh, how to best meet the needs of our sixth and ninth graders. That's correct, Steve. That would be our desire and our plan. Uh, we would move forward with a more concrete idea of what that could look like once the board votes on a, a plan for us to work with. Okay. Which right now doesn't include any of them going back before March 1st. So that would be off the table if if we don't add something here. Um, yeah, I think I want to see where the board is at on it. So I'm, um, can we see the motion again? Sorry. Can we please see the motion again? I should have said it like that. Thank you. Um, I do have a question about the motion. Since we passed Andrew's amendment, do we still need the, and the administration shall develop criteria for transition to virtual learning due to the transmission of COVID within the district schools? Or is I that there because it, this is going back with, um, to the administration to bring something forward to the board? Yeah, I think I, that would be my take as we leave that in there because it signifies that the, the team will come back and at the, you know, we may remove that, that last sentence depending, but Andrew wanted that there in the meantime. So, okay. I, it seems, it, it seems would, a little bit redundant. So I just wanted to make sure that we, we needed both at this point. Yeah. The, the administration yeah, but, is going to have something more refined pro probably. I mean, it's almost certain. Well, they already said they're going to have something yep. with multiple steps in it. It also might not be a bad idea just to have in, you know, it might be a good thing to have it stay in there. Even when we have, you know, looking at the bigger picture, a thousand would be the sign of <clears throat> emergency spread in the community that even if there was something, you know, may, sometimes there might be a point where even if things are going well in our schools, 
it's just so bad that it, we know it's unsustainable and the safer thing to do. And, you know, I, and I realize there's people who, you know, wanted something to be passed tonight that had no COVID numbers in it, but I, I don't think um, we can ignore them right now. Um, I'm going to put in another amendment about grade six to nine and you can vote it up or down. And then I have probably two questions and then I'm, I'm done, but I'll, I'll write that up. And if I could just offer, I think that uh, that was one of the questions I asked Andrew earlier, which he affirmed, which is um, I think there's still an expectation for the, the uh, admin team to come back and look at um, what are triggers for classrooms and schools uh, and, and what will those data points look like and how will we rep represent that to the community so that they can see it too. Um, so I, I would agree with Andrew that there might be a need for both of them. Uh, when you go through that final process, just so that we have both a macro level view of what to do at the district level, but then also a micro level view of what happens in classrooms and schools. Go ahead, Brenda. I'm also wondering if, uh, Dawn, you had mentioned an amendment related to timing of the vaccination, because right now the, uh, the, the motion sets a specific date. I mean, I'd be I'd be willing to uh, make that amendment too. It doesn't. I, I I need the amendment. Whether I make it, Brenda, or you make it, yeah. you would probably you would probably write it more eloquently than no, I would. no. <laughs> um, that would not be that would not be me. Um, you know, I guess I'm I'm wondering what what uh, before I write the amendment, I'm wondering what people are thinking in terms of timing. And I'll, first I'll ask Steve, I guess, um, as I said before, I think the, the first vaccine gives a pretty high level of protection starting two weeks after the vaccine has been given. Um, and, and now, I mean, obviously we thought we knew what was gonna go on next week and now we don't. Um, but if whatever date our teachers get the first vaccine in, is that the, the second vaccine? Is that more time certain? Um, or, <clears throat> and if not, are board members um, willing to, to vote something that's, you know, knowing that the first vaccine will give uh, pretty decent protection um, and vote something that's three weeks out uh, or four weeks out? Um, or, do we or do board members need to have that second vaccine date in the motion also? I just offer real quick that uh, I don't see, uh, I can't see Kristen's face on here, but uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, both the uh, medical professionals at, at uh, Prevea and Bellin have, have both uh, given us some level of assurance that if you get the first vaccine, uh, they have the doses allocated for the second vaccine. So um, okay. they did share with us that they have a high level of confidence that those who get the first will get the second. And do you think they'll get it? I mean, I know the standard time is 21 days. Will they get it in 21 days? That's what they've indicated. And right. I know that uh, Kristen shared that, that those of our employees who have already gone in, they're scheduling their follow-up when they're getting the first vaccine. So uh, right. they appear to be ad adhering to that timeline. All right. And then, um, Will all our teachers be able to get that second? I mean, will all our teachers get their first vaccine on the same day? Will that be Oops, a district? Sorry, I muted. A district no, day? It's a, it's a, unfortunately, it's a first come, first serve basis. And that's why we made the plea with the governor to, to tier the one B's uh, and, and make sure that we weren't fighting with others, whether it was grocery store employees or or those over 65, uh, at least for now, they, they've opened up the over 65. Uh, and, and so on a first come first serve basis, um, um, we're gonna be stuck looking for slots in the queue with many, many, many other people in the community. Um, so they won't get it all on whatever the first date is that it's available for educators. And it, it's likely to be spread out for some period of time after that. For what period of time that I don't know. Steve, the other thing that I would like to add to that is we probably don't want them all getting it on the same day just due to side effects. 
The first vaccine is not bad. Um, some arm tenderness has really been the major thing, a few people with some headaches. But the second one, it could take people out for a day. Um, it seems like symptoms are starting about six to 12 hours after they're getting the vaccine and last for 24 to 36 hours. So it'll actually be better to have them spread out a little bit. How, how many people are getting symptoms that they might be expected to be off work at 1%, 5%, half of them? This is Kristen. It's, you know, really hard to say because everyone's um, reaction is different and everyone's tolerance is much different also. Right, but I'm talking about medical numbers. What percent have reports side? I mean... I would have to look it up. Okay. In, in the meantime, I did send in the, uh, I did, I did send in, I, I think it's a, I think it's a valid enough topic to, um, I think we need to make a decision on, I think it, I think it has merits. And I think, I think the motion as written, they could not start six and nine early with what we've written, um, unless we do this amendment. So I, did I send it, Beth? Thank you. Yep, and I'm just getting it pasted right now. Okay, it should be up. Hey, Andrew, so my question is, if Brenda amends this motion to be based off of vaccines, are you talking about bringing six through nine in before the teachers are vaccinated? Because you have specific dates in here. Or are you talking about pushing out 7th, 8th, 10th, 11th, and 12th? a week later, so 6th and 9th can come in early? No, I think I'm, in the original model, which we're not, is not the motion right now, I was going to propose 6 and 9 coming in a, a week early. I guess if this is modified, if this is modified, and I, I have, I have some real concerns, I, I think we need to if there's an if we need to come back for emergency reasons, we can do that emergency board meeting. But I think people are looking for an answer tonight, and to um, I guess what I would prefer to do with these dates is if if there's a significant delay in the vaccine or school, and I. School staff get um, get the short end of the straw and the you know a second time in the vaccines. Maybe the emergency board meeting is the place to do that because hey, look, the vaccines aren't going to be there. I I would rather have that than you know trying to say that three K through one comes back you know, two weeks after the first vaccine is available to teachers. That's just, um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I think I think if my amendment passes or fails, we will have a date-specific motion. And then if someone wants to amend that to be a vaccine-specific motion, then um, I guess we have a different thing there. And remember, our, our highest risk staff are, are in the group that's getting vaccines starting next week, too. You mean our highest risk staff are in the 1A group, right? <clears throat> They've been getting vaccines already. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Sorry, I just want to make clarify that we don't have another group that's up next week. All right, so Andrew, have you officially made a motion to add this language? Um, yep, so it, it would replace it. It would say a blended instructional model. The, line, the third line would be with AB cohorts in grades 6 and 9 on February 22nd and grades 7, 8, 10, 11, 12 on March 1st, 2021. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, if there's no other discussion, we can vote on adding Andrew's amendment to the original motion. Go ahead, Beth. Thank you. Are you comfortable if I just do a verbal vote? Yep, that's fine. Thank you, Eric. Smith? No. Warren? Uh, I'm so sorry, Brenda. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Sandin Hubo? Aye. Sitnikau? Yes. Becker? Aye. McCoy. Aye. All right, pass five to one. Go ahead, Brenda. So I'm, um, I'm, if we think we would have to come back, Andrew, for another meeting to determine some dates because the vaccine is or is not becoming available, um, I am uncomfortable having specific dates out there um, without, I mean, it seems like we should have an indication of the number of weeks after the vaccine becomes available to our staff. Because otherwise somebody sees this motion in next week and doesn't know all of this back conversation that we've had tonight about the vaccine schedule. It'll just be confusing. Go ahead, Laura. Yes, uh, um, I, I need these days to align with uh, um, what our, our vaccine schedule is more likely to be before I can vote yes on it. So someone would have to, if, if that's what someone wants to do, they want to, I guess they would need to move an amendment they would probably amend all the dates back. So the, the motion now has a February 15th, a February 22nd for just six and nine and a March 1st for everyone else. So probably the easiest way to do an amendment would be to advance them all by a week, advance them all by two weeks, I, I suppose. I'm, I think I'm okay with, see, the the emergency triggered board meeting is the thing that allows me to vote yes on on dates. I'm not thrilled about voting yes on dates, but I can because there's a at least there's an emergency trigger. Uh, no 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 vote here feels feels great, but I think we're you know I don't think we'll ever hit that. Either, so so. so here, here's one of the things that I want to at least point out uh, when it comes to our high schools, uh, high schools and middle schools, is that um, in, in this proposal right now, we strongly believe that every staff will have at least one vaccine. Maybe they don't have their second dose by the time we hit some of those dates. But what we do know is that we can follow every single mitigation strategy. We can socially distance, we can require masks, we can wash hands, we have PPE. All of those other things are in place, which um, the science says is a, you know, significantly prevents the spread of the virus. So one shot, one, one dose of, of vaccine, not two, but one, and every single mitigation strategy feels to me like a compromise 
um, that I would be willing to accept, uh, you know, in, in our upper grades. Now, what we would have to decide is, you know, how do people feel about those younger grades? Again, may not be able to social distance as well, um, being that kids are in a different model. Um, so that, that's one of the things that I would consider to accept this motion, knowing that we feel good at least one round, if not, you know, and the second one is coming. Um, and then it, we can follow every single uh, mitigation strategy, which is why I would um, support the motion as it's written. Go ahead, Rhonda. I will only support the motion as it's written because I'm not willing to add more weeks on to these kids already. You know, they're experiencing this for almost a year. So I'm not willing to continue and add to that one more minute that I have to. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, just to bring a little little levity to the meeting I, w I was happy to find out um like a minute ago that my uh parents are scheduled for the vaccine and i responded with great news and asked my mom about substitute teaching so uh it's probably going to be a no but steve if she wants to apply i'll send her your way um so yeah, maybe it's, um, yeah, I, oh, and I, this does bring up, okay, so if someone is, let's say we, there are some, I don't know how many, but probably some staff have medical situations where the doctors say you can come back when you're officially deemed vaccinated. Um, I would assume for those people, if, if it's, then since they would be able to probably return, um, they might have a sub or a, one of those creative arrangements for a while. I mean, there's we wouldn't mess with their position over them being two weeks, delayed two weeks because their um, ADA or doctor certification says you can come back when you're vaccinated, right? So that'll be uh they'll they'll be working through HR on that. So as they get uh, approval to come back, if if they've got a, a medical exception on file, then uh, we wind up filing following that, uh, and they work directly with uh, with HR to determine their return date. But they, shouldn't, I mean, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't lose their class. I mean, right? That would be silly. Yeah. Over two weeks, we wouldn't have them just flip to a whole different classes we would do a long-term sub knowing that they're cleared but they have to wait till they're officially vaccinated right and they may be able to teach off-site too andrew with their yeah. students on site depending on the grade level of the course if we if we um approve to go back before the second vaccine like kristen said and there's side effects on the second vaccine are we going to <laughs> have a bunch of staff out the first week we're back because people are getting vaccinated and having side effects. I think it's so hard to say that. I was trying to look up very quickly what percentage of staff or people might have significant side effects and, and just very rapidly I couldn't find anything. You know, it shows like 50% might have something, but like I said, everybody's version of what's debilitating to them is very different. Um, and I know that is one of the reasons why the hospitals tried to pace out areas when they were vaccinating, like all the labor nurses didn't get it on Friday. They kind of spaced them out over a few days. So. If I could just jump in for a second, Eric, I, yep. I think you might've mentioned about social distancing. I just want to make sure everybody understands, especially the parents that are watching, that uh, we can't guarantee social distancing at any level, uh, pre-K through 12. We will certainly do our best, um, but I don't want to make any impression out there that we're able to keep all of our students at six foot distance at all time.
if elementary, it won't be that. And high school, it will certainly sometimes not be that. Um, although it's where I, I was on the fence about four day versus AB for middle school, but middle school and high school both share the feature of passing passing time and reduce and at least trying to reduce being packed in the halls is I think important. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Go ahead, Laura. I'm gonna try this one more time. So Wisconsin recorded today 42 more dead people from COVID and 1,500 more cases. And from all accounts, we're going to be dealing with the variant in a very short period of time. And no one really knows how that's going to impact the numbers in our state, let alone in our, you know, in our community. So I feel like we need to pay attention to this. And that's why I feel so strongly about vaccinations uh, for the people that are closest to the children that we serve. So um, and, you know, the, the people that have been sending me basically nonstop hate mail throughout this whole meeting and called my house and posted my number on Facebook and shouted into my phone, I can hear it downstairs. Um, I'm one floor up and I can hear them. You know what, I, want, I would like to just say something to people um, who have targeted our board over the last few weeks. When did it become shameful? to put the health and safety of our students and staff first. This, this is what we have been arguing about and dealing with for months on end. And I know that everyone on our board is gonna vote their conscience tonight and I respect that. And I hope you will for me as well. But, um, you know, it's been just a nonstop um, throughout this entire meeting before we even are gonna take a vote. So I feel strongly about these vaccinations and for good reason. It's not just something that, um, you know, that is just, it's a tangible real thing and it affects real people. And these people teach our students and are close to our students. And we always, you know, we always claim to care about that. Why don't we care about that now? You know, so yes, I would like those dates to line up. It doesn't look like we have the votes for that. So that's my last stab at it. Well, there's only one way to find out and that's to to take a vote. So um, money, unless anyone else has any last minute things. Um... Yeah, sorry, do, do, are we guaranteeing that if you're bilingual, like you're not gonna be moved your program isn't going to, your teacher might change, but you're not going to suddenly get from a bilingual into a, like, not bilingual, right? We would, like, elementary? You, you would there's stay no with... Oh, yeah, okay, there's, that's, no that's, there's no changes. intent, but I need to know it's, like, not going to happen. Like, I, well, I don't, uh, I'll ask uh, if Vicki or uh, Ann or Andrea or others can uh, chime in and tell me whether we can give Andrew an ironclad guarantee on that. Nancy, you can hop on if you want. I, I just would respond. Maybe you can correct me, Nancy. I don't know that we can make any guarantee because we don't know which teachers are going to be on campus and which aren't at this point. Nancy? I, I would diddle that. I'd feel very uncomfortable confirming uh, anything locked in, locked in solid, knowing that we have limited bilingual teachers. And I personally don't know the status of um, whether or not they've been approved for leave or if uh, they're going to be returning. We will do our absolute best to keep our system intact. That's and there's a spot where I think possibly some of your buddy system creative solutions maybe could come into play because I've heard from, um, I've heard, I, I have several bilingual teachers that I, I talk to kind of regularly and it seems like a lot of them are perhaps around the 50% mark of, of their classes. So that might roll out the red carpet to some kind of a buddy a buddy system, you know, two teachers sharing two 
groups kind of thing with one virtual and one not. So I hope that's I hope that's given a solid look as one of the potential options because I think we need to keep you know kids in their in their programs the the best we possibly can. So um, it, it, totally agree with you, Mr. We agree. We yeah. agree. And then, um, in case there are teachers, are, are we, um, as far as like other, we talked about PPE, but also like if there's some other technology needs, if there's, um, I heard about like microphones, because if it's hard, if, if someone is going to be moving around and being in an AB cohort, that maybe the if they want to be able to walk around um can we i mean can we get them a can we get them a microphone can we get them one of these if that lets them maybe move around and you know wide angle the wide angle the camera if if they're in a situation where they have some kids at home and some kids not i'm not saying that's the main model but it could happen from time to time I'd offer that uh, Josh and his team have been really creative about trying to help people meet their needs. So I'm sure they'd be open to working with staff based on, on their tech needs through their building administrators. Yeah, um, the availability of, of microphones and webcams, it, it's pretty robust right now. Um, from what I've heard of the... Well, it's good again or it's not good? Yeah, it's it's pretty good. It's good again. Okay, yeah. good. Um, from what I've heard of the dis the instructional model that's been described, it didn't seem like there would be a high need for that sort of equipment within our classrooms, but that's something we can certainly work out um, with uh, in concert with teaching and learning. Um, I did work with um, Da Vinci, who is in a unique situation where if we were going to do any kind of, if we we're gonna allow any kind of virtual instruction, um, they would have to do max flex because they're, or they're high flex because their curriculum is different. Right. Um, so we did work to get, uh, webcams and in, in their classrooms over there. It's something I'm, I'm certain that we can handle. Okay. I would just hope that the, the, the response would almost all the time be yes. If someone's looking for a piece of equipment that's a two digit number for a cost amid, you know, with COVID funds that can be applied for and, and so forth. Um, okay. And I think that was, um, yep, that was, I think that was everything I had promised I would, um, I would ask. It's, it's really important to me and, and the, I'm uncomfortable not putting this in the motion, but I just could not come up with a way to do it. It's very important to me that those people who have a legitimate family reason to um, stay virtual, that we are looking to creative ways to find a way that they can teach virtual. And it's not just... People are going to say, Andrew, you're just doing that because you want to cater to people who want to work at No, okay. I like working at home okay, but I do IT. It's a different it's a different world. And that said, I only like it okay. I mean, it get, right? So teachers aren't wanting to teach their classes remotely, but some have to. And the kids like having their teachers it's good for kids to have their teachers so i really though there's no way to write this in a motion it's really important to me I, I want to know that in a couple months that hey yep we covered more people than the bare minimum who had family situations that didn't qualify for medical and here's here's some of the creative ways we did pairings or alternative arrangements or beam the teacher into the room. I really hope we hear some of those stories and then ideally file them away for never having to use them again, at least not for, not for this reason, but maybe there's a good, some good things to be learned and some positives for, for non-pandemic times. So I'm, I'm done. 
So, thank you. So I'm <clears throat> somewhat uncomfortable with these dates um, because I think, I mean, I know people feel like we should be serving students and not our staff, but I, we have to have staff in our buildings to be able to run our schools. And I think we saw with our neighboring districts that once we got up above a thousand, you know, they, most of them closed, they were having trouble keeping their staff. And so, um, and so I, I feel like the, the immunization is, is, uh, is an important part of this. Um, again, I, I don't want to open schools and then we get to 900 and a week later we're closed again. Um, I think consistency uh, of instruction has to be part of this equation. Um, the, my original motion um, was based upon possibly getting vaccinated the week of the 25th. And so I put that three weeks later for the younger kids. Um, but if, I, I, I mean, I don't know if we, are people comfortable with setting these dates and then we find out nobody can get immunized until the 15th? Um, that, I guess that's what I'm, I'm, um, I'm concerned about, again, locking into those dates. Um, I would hope that um, we could get some priority for, for our teachers, um, you know, because they're, anyway, but I, so I'm, um, I'm wondering if, I don't know, I guess I'm interested in what people think. Um, you know, the, if they got vaccinated the week of, of uh, uh, sorry, the week of February 1st, um, three weeks later would be the 22nd. Um, you know, I guess I'd be willing to compromise a little bit from the, um, and bring, bring, uh, uh, maybe all of elementary, but, and again, if they, if it doesn't happen, I guess I'd rather, I personally, I'd rather set a week, like three weeks after the first um, immunization is offered to teachers um, for the, for the elementary, and then maybe a week later for a secondary. Brenda, can you actually name a date when you speak like that? I mean, or you speak to that, what date are you thinking? Well, I just, it's, I mean, it depends on the, when the vaccines are available. How, I mean, how has healthcare been able to be running for 10 months with no vaccines? And we can't get this done for kids because and just work through it. I don't understand that. I mean, healthcare has been built and has functioned as an infection control center for 50 years. I mean, that's what, I they what do. I'm saying is it's I have clients who are ICU nurses who are begging for us to get their kids back in school. I, I just, my head is, I, I can't, I can't look at this screen anymore. We need to vote on something. You no, know, Rhonda, that's really disingenuous because most head um, health care workers are, are, believe in the science and want us to follow the science. It's Nobody only- said they didn't believe in the science. I'm just saying it is a fact that there are people who have been working out there in much riskier environments who don't get to wait for vaccination to get back to work. Why can't we just get our kids back to school and trust that we're going to work through this? So- so he, here's what I would add, I think, Brenda, to your original question is that um, in this plan, again, feel very optimistic that uh, staff would have access to at least one dose of the vaccine before some of these dates kick in. Um, it's also important to point out that the vaccine isn't a, a magic wand, right? So that from the CDC, it's one of the mitigation strategies along with masking and washing and, and all of those other things. It makes people uh, feel a little bit better and I think optimistic because it's, it's new. Um, what I would um, recommend respectfully is that we take a vote on this motion. Um, if it passes, uh, we our meeting is over. If uh, it doesn't pass, then we can we don't have to throw the whole thing out. Somebody can then 
remake a motion with different dates and we can um, can go from there. So I, that would be my suggestion. Um, bless you. Um, so just uh, just a thought. And it, again, if, if it doesn't have four votes in the way that it's currently written, then we, you know, we'll, we'll modify it until we can get four votes. Well, why can't we just ask everybody if they would be open to changing those dates? There's a motion on the table. It's been seconded. and we've, we've worked this amendment now for uh, over three hours. Um, I, I would suggest voting on it and then we'll, we'll see where we fall. So with that said, Beth, um, please open up voting on the, the amendment or on the entire motion. Online voting has been open. Can you read that motion out loud, please? Absolutely. And Thank you. The original motion, the, you will not see the amendments in there, but they have been passed. So, so just to be clear, we're, we're, we're voting on the whole thing now. Correct. Okay. Would you like me to read it with amendments? Yes, please. My screen? The Green Bay Area Public School District shall commence in-person instruction Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for K through first grade on February 15th, second through fifth grades, excuse me, second through fifth grades on March 1st in a blended instructional model with with A, B cohorts in grades six and nine on February 22nd in grades 7, 8, 10, 11, and 12 on March 1st, 2021, with the week of March 22nd, all students attending virtual, and the same models of instruction resuming March 29th, 2021, and that the administration shall develop criteria for transition to virtual learning due to transmission of COVID within the district schools. Should the Brown County case burden reach 1,000 cases per 100,000 population for 14 days, an emergency board meeting shall be called regarding learning models. All right, are we ready to vote? Did you open it online or are you gonna do? I'll do, um, um, I'll just call everybody's name if that's okay. 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 Warren? No. Oops, yeah, I'm wrong. I'm sorry, Brenda, you're no? No, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Becker? I'm sorry, Andrew, on mute. Aye. McCoy? No. Sitnikau? Yes. Smith? No. And in Hoover? Aye. All right, motion um, is tied three to three, which means that it does not pass. Um, I guess I would ask anyone who voted no if they would be comfortable making a similar motion and if you need us to pull that back up um, with any modifications that you might suggest. Go ahead, Brenda. Um, I will change shall commence in-person instruction, instruction for 3K through first grade um, three weeks after immunizations are available to teachers and second through fifth grades uh, uh, one week later. Brenda, could we, could we bring all of our? Yeah, I think I did. I, I was going to. Uh, I mean, take the K three to first out and just bring all of our elementary back at the same time. Okay. So three K through fifth grade. Oh, 
the blended the 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 secondary kids would be oh and then oh sorry i forgot about the amendment um uh Um, I guess the AB cohorts um, the same week as the 3K through 5th. I mean, they'll be able to social distance decently um, because there'll only be two grades in the school. So passing time and lunch and all those things should be pretty well distanced. So I'm comfortable with that as three weeks. Um, and then the uh, AB cohorts in, on, uh, or, and then with AB cohorts, grade seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and Mar or on uh, one week later. So what's the definition of, oh, I, I'll wait for a second, for there to be a second. I'll Brenda, second. Is, oh, sorry, I just went before Laura, before you second. This is the way you want it to read, Brenda? I just want to do a, a last wordsmith. Yeah, that sounds fine. Um, and I guess what I mean by a vaccine, and I don't know if I have to define this more, but what I mean by vaccinations are available to teachers. It's the, the three weeks from the first day that those are available. Because that would assure that all teachers would be in that, you know, po two week post vaccination window um, when they come back. I'm assuming our teachers can get vaccinated in a week. That's the assumption I'm making. On so, that. And school staff, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All staff. Yeah, all staff, sorry. To school, well, to school, I think to <clears throat> at least, school, at least staff. school staff. Yeah, Yeah, I would agree. Steve, can I, can I ask you a question? Certainly. Um, Did this get seconded? Sorry. Oh. I, I, Did you second, Laura? I did. Yes, she did. Okay, sorry. I missed that. I was concentrating on my amendment. <laughs> Steve, I just want to ask you a question. So this is a, you know, this is a very important trigger, you know, that date that it becomes available. So are, when that happens, will you be able to um, at least let the board and then anybody who has a, a stake in that, right, who needs to to, to um, or if even if you have lead time where you can say, look, we know now that it's gonna be this date um, and prepare yourself and sign up and get everything so that, so that there's no kind of last, last minute, you know, jockeying for slots and things like that, that people are, are ready and, and ready to, you know, ready to go. So I offer that uh, Bellin and Purvey have both been very forthcoming with us about this process, uh, as was evidenced from the fact that they're they're contacting me literally during the meeting to give me updates. Um, so I have a high level of confidence that um, when they know first date available, that they will let us know. And then I'd offer that uh, Kristen has been working with our team, uh, Terry, Melissa, uh, and others. Um, and we've got a really robust notification process. They did a great job with the 1As. Um, figuring out who's on that list and how to get the notice out to them. Um, they've already got those draft notices ready to go. So uh, we can be immediately responsive uh, when we're told uh, what the date is. And we will keep you as a board up to speed on that. Thanks, Steve. Can I just ask a question? I just want to make sure that if the dates for the vaccine becoming available and then three weeks later is after March 22nd, do you want any changes with how this motion is written? I, I just want to make sure that this is taking into account that if it's pushed back and staff aren't able to be eligible for that vaccine, which would then not align with the March 22nd or March 29th dates. Well, it would align with March 22nd because everybody would be virtual. 
So maybe it's, um, so I think that's okay. Right, Melissa? Um, I think we're going to have to meet, if, if we're talking about all the, if, if this gets delayed that yeah. long, I'm certainly, I, it wouldn't, if we don't have a, if this is the motion that passes and we don't have a definitive vaccine date for teachers within two weeks, I'm going to, I'm going to request an emergency board meeting, much less seven weeks, though I, I appreciate wanting to have it covered, but this will certainly have to be revoted if we're um, stuck like that. Okay. I, I'm I going to have to vote no up. on this though, because I can't, I can't vote. I would rather, although I, I know it's a valid point that some people would like what I'm about to say less than what we're doing here. I would rather put dates out there and, and consider having to change if there's a problem with the vaccine than to have uh, our final motion for tonight left in the hands of a of a third party. If this if this fails in the interest of getting something to pass, I would consider Brenda the motion the way Brenda made it with everything bumped back one additional week. I might be able to vote for that, but I have to vote no on this on the grounds that there's it's it's too it's too third party dependent. I would rather set something and have to change it than set something nebulous like this. So that's where I'm at. So just to clarify, Andrew, you're saying you can't vote for this as written at this time. Right. I could, I could live with it going back another week from what Brenda originally said, if that would make it pass. But I can't, I can't tell the public that we, we spent four hours and what we, what we came up with is tying the, tying this to a, tying this to another, tying this to a, to a separate event that I could, I could see a lot, I could see there being problems with arguments about interpretation. Um, well, what if, you know, maybe some, yeah, I just, that, so, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm at. I think we need to vote on it this way and see what happens. So Andrew, just to clarify, so you're comfortable setting dates a week later, and if the vaccine is not, a com uh, not, available at all, you're comfortable sending our teachers back to school without any vaccines at all. So we have, we have procedures in place for that. We have ability to have, we have the ability to have um, remote work. Um, I, it really, it depends a lot on what's, it depends a lot on what the actual situation is. I'm, it's more about tying it to uh, tying it to a third party like this. It, se it seems like we're. I would ha I would have to think about it seriously if if we found out something went very wrong with vaccine distribution. I'd have to really think about. It. I think there are some teachers who are ready to go back pre vaccine if the the right if they're assured the right PPE is there as we've been talking about all along. I think I, I'm sorry, I don't think I know there are many teachers ready to go back if we're looking at creative solutions. Um, but you know, I've I've talked enough. I'm I'm going to be a no on this, and then if it's if it passes, if it passes anyways, it probably won't be that far off because the vaccine will probably come, and, and it's more of a technical reason. If it if it deadlocks again, I'll try something that I think might have a chance to get us to four or five. So. Let's see what happens. Why are you a no on this? Because it is because I'm voting on something that I have no control over the like the it's completely tied to a outside decision where I think there could be room for confusing interpretation over it. The whole thing is. What if a teacher what what if 
like, like, what if, who, who knows, what if DHS comes out and says, well, since I don't think this will happen, I almost hate to throw this hypothetical out there, but what if they say uh, high school, you know, older kids are more risk, so we're going to let certain teachers of older kids get it. I don't think that would happen, but then... Is it triggered or is it not triggered if they don't post? You know, Andrew, the you and way? I are going to call a special board meeting um, ourselves per the policy that you actually talked about, and we're going to get kids in school if that happens. Um, may, okay. I mean, that's what we'll do. I, well, I mean, maybe we'll. I mean, I'm, I I don't know what I'd have to know what the situation is on the ground before I would I would vote. Um, I I can't. You know, I could vote for something with dates if there was a caveat about COVID numbers. I could have voted for something probably with driven by higher COVID numbers. Um, I made it clear, you know, with with my vote on the previous motion that I thought we were good to go with a reasonable compromise. It failed three to three. I clearly showed where I stood on it, and if it, if this come if this fails and it comes back with a week later, um, or something, I'll I could probably vote for it. But I think I think the first try was about right. I think we get something on the books and we keep fighting. Let's just do that. All right. So there's a motion on the table. Uh, Beth, I think we're ready to vote. Thank you. I'm going to do a roll call vote, Eric, if that's okay. Yep, that's fine. Men? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vanden Hubel? Aye. Sitnikau? I'm going to vote aye on this, but I, uh, okay. I'm hoping that we can expedite the process. McCoy? Aye. Becker? No. I voted yes on a stronger proposal a few minutes ago. All right. The motion passed five to one. All right. With that said, uh, I'd look for a motion to adjourn. Eric? Yep. If you mind, I'd just like to say something. Um, so I just want to, I, I think we actually, it was hard and it was excruciating at times, but I think we did some good work here tonight, believe it or not. A lot of people, our staff, we're all prepared. We covered an enormous amount of, of territory. And I sh I'm sure there's more that's going to have to be covered as well as the days unfold. But um, as hard as it was and as long as it was, I just want to thank you all. All right, looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? All right, pass 6 0. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920-448 2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible. <music>